The next item of business is a debate on Motion 560 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on partnership action for continuing employment known to all and sundry and to us as PACE. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak to buttons now? And there's quite a bit of time in hand, surprisingly. So interventions are actually invited from the, the PO here, whether Mr Wheelhouse wants them or not. Right, Mr Wheelhouse, calling the Minister to speak and to move the motion. It says here 14 minutes, but you can make it longer if you wish. Officer, I'll do my best to oblige and happy to take interventions, of course, to, to help with the passage of time. Um, but thank you, President Officer. And the Scottish Government's initiative for responding to redundancy situations, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, or, or PACE, is one of our most effective interventions as in, and is a unique service to Scotland. And yet PACE remains largely low profile in terms of consciousness of the people of Scotland. So one of the key aims of this debate is to raise awareness of PACE among any individuals who either now or at some point in the future face redundancy while also uh, affording me the opportunity to recognise and praise the efforts of the PACE partners themselves. So I also wish to, to ensure that members who may receive approaches from constituents are well informed, uh, as can be, and in a position to advise on the support that's available through PACE to their constituents. So I'll therefore be arranging for literature and PACE services to be distributed directly to members' offices, which I hope will be helpful to colleagues in supporting your constituents in the future. We are also looking at increasing the range of marketing materials to ensure a balanced approach between digital, social media, targeted communications and hard copy uh, and print to improve uh, general awareness raising of PACE and what it uh, can provide. As we know every year, sadly, regardless of the economic context uh, and due to the nature of market changes and other factors that happen uh, from time to time, new businesses are born, existing businesses grow, but the converse, converse is also true as businesses end up in difficulties or ultimately cease trading. So it is difficult to be definitive about the numbers affected by redundancy as any figures are based inevitably upon estimates. However, what I can be clear on is that from April 2016 until March 2017, PACE has supported 15,167 individuals and 299 employers. However, we do know that uh, while HR1 forms tell us where redundancy occurs for 10 or more employees, that this does not capture the full scale of those affected. So PACE support varies and can be provided in a number of ways, from providing information to the more intensive programme of tailored support, which includes one-to-one -one advice on careers guidance, interview skills, CV preparation, workshops uh, and benefits, etc. From April 2016 until March 2017, 6,500 individuals received intensive PACE support, and this is key as we know individuals benefit greatly from this intensive level of support. We're therefore very keen to ensure that we continue to both extend the reach of PACE uh, to support as many individuals as possible, particularly those who are not covered by the HR1 process, uh, small um, businesses that might be laying off one or two workers to make sure they're aware of the support that's available to them. And I would ask members across the chamber to do your best to make sure that that takes place. Uh, and also, I, I certainly will. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I very much welcome what the Minister is saying. I wonder if he will agree that one of the great strengths of PACE is that it draws in all of us of all political representations to the room. I know I've sat with uh, Lewis MacDonald, for example, uh, in PACE meetings, which enables us all to bring our individual contributions, contacts and knowledge, but also that by involving UK departments like the Department for Work, it draws the net as wide as we possibly can, and that's one of the very great strengths that PACE has, while I'm sure the debate might nonetheless identify areas where we can fine-tune and continue to improve the process. Minister. Well, I'm very grateful to Stuart Stevenson for raising that very important point. Uh, it's something I'll return to later, but I think I do want to put on record, I know that there's been a hugely positive contribution from members across the chamber when situations have arisen where sadly jobs are at risk or, or ultimately face redundancy. Uh, the work that has been taken forward, as, as Stuart Stevenson says, many members come to this, this place with a lot of uh, background either in the trade union movement or indeed as employers or indeed having uh, been in the workplace in positions of management. So bringing the expertise and also local information, local knowledge and context to be able to help the PACE partners to deliver better service for those who are affected. So I very much welcome the remarks that Stuart Stevenson uh, has made and want to thank him and other members uh, for their work in the Fraserburgh Task Force in particular. Uh, but we all know other high profile examples such as the, uh, the work in response to the loss of steel jobs in, in Lanarkshire, which was hugely successful, not least because of the, the widespread uh, party, uh, non-party political approach that was taken by members across the chamber to support those efforts. 
Well, we are very keen, as I say, to ensure we both extend the reach of PACE to support as many individuals as possible and to deepen the engagement with those accessing the support as well to, to ensure they do get the maximum benefit. On the 23rd of June 2009, we established the Ministerial PACE Partnership, which uh, brings 21 organisations together with the Scottish Government to oversee a continuous improvement programme to enhance the operation of PACE. And as part of that continuous improvement programme, we published uh, research in October of last year, which indicated that those of, uh, of those surveyed uh, who had received PACE support, almost three quarters, 71%, had obtained employment, uh, which is very encouraging. And this compares with a figure of 51% in the 2010 survey. Now, clearly, this does reflect a number of things, including improvements in the labour market since 2010, which we, we should acknowledge, but also the ongoing evaluation and refinement of the support that's provided by PACE to ensure the service is continually improving and working as effectively as it can be. It's also important to emphasise our message to employers and their employees that our research and our experience makes it clear that the earlier that PACE support can be provided, uh, the more effective that support will ultimately be. And our research also shows that most clients are highly satisfied with the package of support the PACE service is delivering. For the majority of individual PACE services, satisfaction levels sit at over 80%. However, for clients aged 50 or over, uh, though there, there is a slightly lower satisfaction rate with the PACE package of support, and we therefore commissioned research earlier this year to investigate this lower satisfaction rate. Uh, and this qualitative research has highlighted some very useful insights, both about the additional barriers over 50s may face in the labour market, uh, age discrimination and other factors, and the need, from the perception of those involved and who've gone through the process, and the need to tailor support better for those who need more intensive support in interview and CV pre preparation, perhaps. I, I certainly will. Elaine Smith. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, would that also include tailoring support for people with additional support needs, for example, like dyslexia? That's, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's a very important point. Um, we, we shouldn't take for granted that particularly older workers who've maybe gone through an educational system that failed to recognise their needs and perhaps didn't address uh, the, the, the particular needs they, they, they had at the time, maybe going into work successfully, but then when trying to face the transition to a new career, perhaps where they're requiring uh, to demonstrate skills in areas such as digital uh, skills or, or other, other factors that they may need additional support. So I'll certainly take that very important point that Elaine Smith has made away with me and, and uh, put that forward as an action for the next evaluation meeting. But there was indeed much to digest from the, from the research and we will indeed look to improve our PACE offering for this important client group, picking up the point that Elaine Smith has just made, uh, to see if we can make it easier for those who find it particularly difficult to re-enter the labour market, uh, despite in many cases having extremely impressive experience to boast of, they just haven't got the formal qualifications to recognise that or indeed uh, lack confidence in going forward in the, uh, the job market. And I must stress that PACE is available for every individual affected by redundancy, no matter the size of the business, nor the number of employees involved. And I would like to reinforce that point because I don't think that is well understood. Because we do tend to talk about PACE in the context of large employers, high profile employers that may be being affected by redundancy in, in members' areas. And we sometimes forget that obviously on a case by case basis, small and medium sized enterprises may be shedding one or two jobs. That's still hugely important to those individuals involved. And therefore they should be aware that the same level of support is available to them. Skills Development Scotland leads on the delivery of PACE support on behalf of the Scottish Government and in conjunction with uh, key partners including the Department for Work and Pensions and local authorities amongst others. And there are 18 local PACE teams across Scotland to ensure speedy and effective responses to redundancy situations. Now, crucially, while standard information is uh, issued to all those who are affected where possible, each PACE response is ultimately tailored to meet the needs of each and every individual who engages with PACE. So in some cases, there will be time for a planned programme of support to be developed. That's important because we have found that some uh, individuals who are maybe uh, have a higher level of skills and qualifications sometimes think that the initial stage of the PACE support indicates that that support isn't relevant to them. So we have many highly qualified people, for example, in the oil and gas industry coming out with a lot of skills, think that initial contact might indicate that perhaps the services aren't relevant. But if they are to engage on a case-by-case -case basis, the approach will be tailored to their needs to reflect the level of experience and background they have to ensure that they have the best chance to gain uh, gainful employment. Minister, I certainly will. Dean Lockhart. PACE encompasses a partnership, I believe, of 22 different organisations, which I think is a strength because uh, these organisations can bring many different uh, areas of expertise to the table. Um, is the composition of PACE reviewed on a regular basis so that if, if there are, for example, uh, issues with the oil and gas sector or different sectors, you can bring in uh, people with appropriate experience? Minister. 
That, that's certainly the case. I mean, certainly the, the membership of the group is evaluated. We'll always keep an eye out for if there are organisations that might add some value to the, to the process, uh, as I understand it. We always have the ability, of course, to bring in experts to speak to us and engage with the, uh, the, the, the uh, PACE partnership group to uh, perhaps give a briefing on a particular subject that's um, uh, important to all partners. We have the services of the Office of Chief Economic Advisor as well to give us detailed breakdowns and, and analysis of issues such as those affecting the oil and gas industry. Uh, but again, if there are specific recommendations that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that you're aware, aware of, I'm sorry, Presiding Officer Mr. Clark, um, uh, Lockhart is, is aware of that he can provide that to me and I would certainly uh, take that on board. Now, um, as I say, it is important to emphasise that it's a tailored programme of support to, to individuals. And there are uh, really good examples of where work has been uh, taken forward in a very uh, sophisticated way to respond to individual situations. For example, in January of this year, as some members may be aware, Aegis uh, Quick Fit Insurance Services regrettably announced the closure of their Uddingston office where 521 employees were based. And this was extremely bad news, of course, for a uh, local community. But as a conscientious employer, and I do want to praise the company for this, AGS um, wish to do their best to support their employees to find onward employment opportunities in the local area and work very closely with the Scottish Government and our agencies towards this end. Uh, so I set up a working group to provide support, which included AGS, uh, Scottish Government, North Lanarkshire Council and Scottish Government agencies through our PACE initiative. And through this process, we identified more than 2,000 vacant roles within the locality of the site, which were available to employees through four on-site jobs fairs, which AGS arranged and which uh, 44 separate organisations attended. PACE staff work closely with the company and their outplacement agency to deliver a tailored programme of support. This support included 13 PACE presentations, 50 workshops on CV preparation, career management and interview skills, and more than 200 one-to-one -one career planning interviews with a PACE advisor. And around 450 employees took up this service. And as at the end of March 2017, when the site closed, over 300 employees, or two-thirds of the total, had already secured successful outcomes before the site even closed. So I would stress that PACE support uh, continues to be available for anyone within the former QuickFit Insurance team who may still require assistance and more generally for other situations that arise. Um, once, the, once the factory or plant is closed, uh, there's still support available to those affected. But unfortunately, it's inevitable that some businesses face severe financial difficulties and this can uh, result in there being no time for PACE to provide support to affected employees prior to notification of entering administration. So, Presiding Officer, I also want to highlight that the insolvency profession in Scotland plays an important role in the Scottish economy, helping to rescue just under 1,000 businesses and saving nearly 22,500 jobs each year. I'm therefore very grateful for the contribution that the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland plays in the work of PACE, ensuring close collaboration with insolvency professionals uh, to achieve a positive outcome for employees and other creditors in difficult situations, working alongside trade unions and stakeholders to achieve as good an outcome as possible. The strong working relationship between PACE partners and ICAS promotes access to over 10,500 chartered accountants in Scotland who are often the first port of call for businesses requiring advice or who hold positions within companies that may face having to make redundancies. Collectively, ICAS chartered accountants and insolvency practitioners ensure that employers and employees have access to assistance at an appropriate time. And this access to assistance is key in minimising the effects and risks of redundancy, which can have such a detrimental impact on individuals, their family life and the wider Scottish economy. So I'd like to turn now to consider the economic outlook and the climate in which PACE is operating today. Uh, the Scottish economy has remained resilient through 2016, despite the significant challenges that continue to face the oil and gas sector. And compounding these challenges, the heightened uncertainty that has been created by Brexit has led to consumer confidence in Scotland falling, as uh, we've seen elsewhere in the UK as well. Uh, however, it's vital to note that Scotland's economy grew 0.4% in 2016, and Scotland's labour market has continued to show considerable resilience. Latest data to March 2017 show that uh, our unemployment rate has fallen to 4.4%, uh, lower than the UK rate of 4.6%. Uh, Scotland continues to outperform UK on both female and youth employment rates. Uh, I'm aware of the economic in inactivity figures, which are, are, are less positive, but with employment 48,000 higher in Scotland than a year ago as the end of quarter one 2017, that is a positive outcome. And the 0.2% contraction in the Scottish economy in the final quarter of 2016 stemmed largely from the continued slowdown in the oil and gas sector and the impacts this is having on its wider supply chain. We do know, though, that the headwinds affecting the Scottish economy can have varying impacts across Scotland's regions. For example, the recent labour market data for January to December 2016 
has shown there have been decreases in employment in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and the Highlands. Uh, this is clearly likely to be driven by the fall in the oil price affecting investment in North Sea oil and gas industry and its supply chain. There are, however, encouraging signs that the situation is improving for North Sea operators and it's clear that the oil and gas sector has a long-term future. So we will work to support the supply chain in the interim to ensure it can gain from future opportunities. And the oil and gas industry clearly remains of vital importance to the economy of both Scotland and the UK, sporting 330,000 jobs across the UK, with 124,500 in Scotland alone. It's contributed around 330 billion in revenues to the UK exchequer since production began. But our £12 million transition training fund has already directly supported over 2,000 individuals now made redundant as a consequence of the downturn in the industry, while a further 755 are being assisted through two procurement rounds to uh, provide new employment opportunities again through the transition training fund. Examples of other headwind impacts on local authorities are those such as South Lanarkshire, Fife, Edinburgh and Glasgow, which have all been affected by uh, a reduction in activity in the manufacturing sector. And local authorities such as North Lanarkshire have been impacted by tightening uh, budget uh, constraints in the public sector. The labour market in Scotland is strong and resilient. And latest figures show that unemployment in Scotland is lower than in the UK as a whole. And since last year, employment in Scotland has risen, as I say, by 48,000. Scotland also has an innovative business environment. And since 2007, the number of registered businesses in Scotland has grown by 15% to an all-time record level. And we do, through PACE and other services, which might not be immediately obvious, through PACE, we try and provide support to those individuals who, perhaps receiving redundancy payments, are able to start a new business and uh, tailored support, again, through Scottish Enterprise, Highlands Islands Enterprise, to make that happen, and Business Gateway Services at a local level as well. I will indeed. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the Minister referred to uh, people getting uh, relatively substantial uh, redundancy payments. Um, I'm not aware that PACE has previously done this, but would he consider uh, whether in particular circumstances uh, people who receive such payments are in a position to receive advice as to what might be the best way they can get the best quote bang for the buck from such payments and in particular speaking for people a little bit older uh, how they might use that as part of their preparation for a retirement that might be disrupted and financially affected by the fact that they've been paid off at a point in their career where there will be limited opportunities for them to replace uh, the job and the further development of their pensions. Um, it strikes me that the whole issue of uh, payoffs, and, and that perhaps in the oil and gas industry in the Northeast, we've seen quite a lot of people take the money and kind of drop out of the system for a long period of time when it may be in the long-term interest to receive good advice, perhaps take a slightly different approach. Minister. I, th I think that's a fair point, presiding officer, that uh, Mr Stevenson makes. Uh, certainly, there will be a, a range of circumstances affecting individuals who are facing redundancy, some who will be closer to retirement, and as the member uh, points out, maybe potentially in receipt of significant, uh, significant um, uh, funds as a part of a redundancy package to, to sort of evaluate their options. And uh, I'm aware there is uh, some support in around the area, but I will try and provide uh, written information which I provide to all members as to what uh, that is already available and take on board the point that Mr Stevenson makes that, that may be an area for future enhancement of the service, if possible, to do so. Um, the economic outlook, uh, presiding officer, does remain uh, positive, uh, as I said and cited in some statistics. Uh, we believe that the main risk, and I appreciate this may not be something that all members in the chamber agree about, uh, we do believe the main risk facing Scotland's economy continues to be the prospect of a hard Brexit. And uh, there is concern about Chartered Institute Procurement reporting this week that 45% of European companies are looking to replace UK suppliers with EU suppliers. And we hope that doesn't come to pass, obviously. But the important point to make in respect of that, presiding officer, is it's important to recognise and for members, indeed, to reinforce the message across this chamber that Scotland is very much open for business and continues to attract more investment. And there are two examples which I just want to cite just to give a more positive message on uh, today's uh, debate. That we have seen £11.1 million of investment in East Kilbride, recently in a subsea development centre by a German company, TUV SUD, and the creation of 300 jobs in Glasgow through investment by global professional services firm Genpac. So there is continued investment flows into the UK and indeed into Scotland, and that's positive uh, to record. While change is now inevitable, regardless of which constitutional future those of us in this chamber seek to, to pursue, the Scottish Government's twin approach of growing the economy and tackling inequality will be at the heart of our efforts to meet the challenges that lie ahead and to seize opportunities. 
As members may be aware, we have been undertaking the enterprise and skills review, and while the process is still to conclude, the benefits we envisage from this are simplification of the enterprise and skills landscape, improvement in collaborative working and coordination, and improvement in delivery of enterprise and skills support, all of which we believe will contribute uh, ultimately to uh, our, our already uh, pattern of collaborative working that PACE has established with its partners. And, presiding officer, our business support policies will continue to focus on ensuring businesses can grow and thrive. And to pick up the point that's made by the Labour Amendment, um, working to help companies avoid situations where there is a risk of redundancies uh, is vital. And we accept that. We also recognise the importance of engagement uh, with, in terms of the Conservative Amendment with UK ministers on the industrial strategy. And, and the Cabinet Secretary has had positive discussions with uh, Greg Clark uh, in recent times on that theme. And therefore, we will be supporting both Labour and Conservative amendments today uh, in this debate. So through their account management, our enterprise agencies, PACE partners, provide a range of early preventative measures to negate potential closure and alleviate difficulties. And operating on a confidential referral basis, work is rightly carried out behind the scenes. I should say, presiding officer, I can keep talking if you wish me to. I've still got more material, but if I'm conscious of it. Uh, just let me check if we're all awake. <laughs> yes, we're all awake. Thank you can keep you. talking. Um, if it's of help to the Chamber, I will con continue to talk. The challenge is uh, to encourage um, a business to engage early enough to address the potential difficulties before they become insurmountable. And SE and HI have a broad and highly innovative range of tools at their disposal to support companies, so including those experiencing difficulty. And these include grant support, of course, and a wide range of support options for businesses, including mentoring support and other means by which we can improve their performance. Now, SDI can also offer invaluable support and advice to global companies, exploring the range of opportunities available in Scotland as well. And our support to companies is actively maintained throughout difficult periods to explore all possible options for retaining operations and jobs in Scotland. And as I say, regrettably, in some cases, that is not possible. Despite the best efforts of officials, local authorities, trade unions, other partners, there is no viable commercial future that can be found. And it may result in a closure situation and, indeed, sadly, job losses. So our focus then shifts to ensure that effective work for, affected workforce is given the support it needs and deserves and to mitigate the economic impact on the surrounding area. In cases where there is a business failure, a decision to close part of a business or particular difficulties within a sector, the pace response is usually sufficient, but occasionally circumstances, as Stuart Stevenson has outlined, require the intervention of national government. And in those particular situations, there can be value in us intervening directly, and we have established task forces which have, uh, to re-emphasise the point, been very bipartisan in nature and very positive in, in their uh, progress. So these task forces... Uh, we'll, and I will discuss a number uh, in my closing speech, bring together national and local politicians, local authorities, public sector agencies, company and workforce representatives, such as the trade unions, to respond to challenges and, where possible, find positive outcomes in extremely difficult circumstances. So by bringing people together to understand the challenges and what can be done to mitigate the direct and indirect impacts, we make connections that might otherwise not be made. And this ensures that every avenue is explored, every potential source of support is considered, every possible solution can be delivered. And I've seen at first hand the excellent work that has been done in Fraserburgh Task Force, Fife and Longanic Task Forces, the latter two uh, in Fife having set up to mitigate the impact of the closure of Tullis Russell papermakers in Mark Inch and the early decommissioning of Longanic Power Station. And the success of both task forces is clearly demonstrated. The Fife Task Force helped achieve positive outcomes for 83% of PACE clients during the task force lifespan, while the figure at Longanic was 87%. So the Scottish Government is committed to creating a, a culture of fair work, uh, and this is supported uh, by measures such as the Fair Work Convention. I'll turn to them in my closing, closing remarks. I'm actually going to ask you to start closing. Oh, great. Excellent. I won't I've give other job. people a bite of this big cherry. I've, do, I've done my job, uh, President Officer. And in conclusion, I believe PACE is an excellent example of the Scottish Government working in partnership with our stakeholders, working with colleagues in the Chamber where that's required to maximise benefit for individuals, for communities and for Scotland's economic growth. And I'd like to thank all our PACE partners for their support and all our efforts. PACE uh, partners include agencies which provide skills development and employability support, retraining, upskilling, uh, directly people at the coalface who are facing redundancy. And we also include organisations which provide support to spread the message of PACE to their members. So many members in this chamber have contacted me about PACE support for their constituents, and I thank them all for their efforts. And I would be grateful to hear their thoughts during this debate on how we can build on that success of PACE and make it even more successful for those affected. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Please move the motion. Oh, and I move the motion in my name. I've got 20 minutes in hand. That's, I don't want people to panic and think they're not going to get their time. Uh, call Dean Lockhart. It's a liberal nine minutes, Mr Lockhart. Perhaps not as liberal as unless Mr <coughs> Stevenson intervenes again. Mr Lockhart. Thank you, thank you Deputy President Officer. I suspect it will be a conservative nine minutes, not, not a liberal nine minutes. Um, 
Let, let me start by congratulating uh, Mr. Wheelhouse in extending his opening speech. I hope he hasn't ex exhausted too much of his uh, closing speech, and I look forward to hearing his closing remarks. This is a welcome opportunity to debate the, the work of the, uh, the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, or PACE, as we know it. It is also a timely opportunity to consider the work of PACE in responding to redundancy situations, how it functions, and I think most importantly, the challenges it will face in the future. We will be supporting the government uh, motion this evening. We will also be supporting the Labour amendment. Our amendment to the motion today seeks to do two things. First, it highlights the need for policy and government agencies, including PACE, to anticipate and plan for the rapidly increasing changes impacting many sectors of the economy. Changes driven by new technologies, automation and other developments, and which could in large, uh, result in large-scale redundancies if, as policymakers, we do not plan for them. And secondly, our amendment encourages the Scottish Government to follow the advice of leading organisations to cooperate with the UK Government's industrial strategy to ensure that sectors and businesses across Scotland are fully prepared to meet these challenges. Before looking at some of the future challenges we have to face, I want to highlight the valuable work undertaken by PACE. As the National Strategic Partnership Framework for Responding to Redundancy Situations, PACE coordinates responses from 22 different organisations across Scotland and the UK uh, as a whole. Skills Development Scotland uh, delivers PACE in conjunction with these partner organisations and as we've heard, there's a national team based in Glasgow supported by 18 local teams across Scotland. Every year, PACE supports thousands of individuals across Scotland during a very challenging time in their lives when they are facing the prospect of redundancy and the loss of their livelihood. To deal with the different needs of individuals in these very difficult circumstances, PACE provides a number of tailored services, including one-to-one -one counselling, access to high quality training, seminars on starting business, and as we heard, an, an increasing number of people affected by redundancy are choosing to, do, uh, to, to open their own business or start their own business, which I think is something that we should encourage. Uh, PACE also gives access to IT facilities and helps people to prepare business plans if they are looking to start their own business. Historically, PACE has been primarily targeted at large-scale redundancies, but improvements in its service offering now mean that it can help more individuals and smaller companies in rural areas as well as larger companies in urban areas, and that's very much to be welcomed. PACE undertakes regular client experience surveys to get a sense of what's working and, and what uh, can be improved. And the most recent survey last year pointed to a number of positive outcomes. Three quarters of clients were satisfied with their interaction with PACE. Employment outcomes are generally positive. 71% of clients had secured work after assistance from PACE. Of those that had secured... Uh, yeah, sure. The inevitable Mr Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Uh, presiding officer, I, I wonder if the member would uh, agree with me that it can also be useful to have the employer in the room who may be paying off. I, I say that in particular because in Fraserburgh, where we had a major payoff, we were fortunate to have the company in the room. And one of the direct effects of that, hearing the ideas of people around the table, was that the company modified its plans and also that the trade unions seem to have gained uh, a, an opportunity to better interact in a safe space with the employer and come up with something that mitigated the worst effects of it. So I think the clients are not simply sometimes those who are affected through their employment, but also sometimes the companies. And we shouldn't uh, fail to recognize that just there's always a benefit of having a safe space for people and communities and companies and trade unions who are affected by what's planned, all being in the room, working through solutions that may be better than the initial uh, prognosis might have been. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. I think Mr. Stevenson makes a very good point, and I think it's, um, we'll come on, on to this a bit later. It all also feeds back into the, uh, the need, perhaps, for PACE and the enterprise agencies uh, to get involved in discussions earlier and perhaps have a more proactive response and not just wait for difficult situations to arise, but to, uh, to, to address um, some of the problems earlier in the process that may ultimately end in uh, PACE being involved in, in the process. Um, so 71% of clients uh, secure work after 
assistance from PACE. And of those that do secure work, the majority find work with at least the same or higher levels of skills or responsibility. However, a, a sizable proportion, roughly a third, uh, are only able to secure work with a lower level of skills or responsibility, and a proportion of clients who have secured work uh, end up with work uh, with a lower pay, a lower level of pay, and that's roughly about 60%. Of, of workers who have been helped by PACE. However, I do think in the difficult context of redundancy situation, these are positive results. And I do commend the hard work of everyone involved in the PACE partnership. There is always more to be done, however, and a number of recommendations were made as a result of the survey findings I mentioned. Uh, these uh, recommendations include the need for PACE to enter earlier in the process, as I mentioned to Mr. Stevenson, um, given that PACE acts as a gateway to other options such as starting a new business or, or retraining, it's important that vulnerable workers get help as soon as possible so they can explore all possible options. There's also need for more tailored support, as, as the Minister mentioned, for older workers aged 55 and over. The post-redundancy outcomes for those this age group is typically poorer. Now, this might be, and I think someone mentioned this already, one reason for this might be um, uh, workers of that age, uh, if they are made redundant, they either start their own business or they perhaps leave the workforce altogether, and that might be something behind the increasing levels of uh, inactivity in, in the Scottish economy, because these workers would not uh, fall within the statistics. And finally, there's uh, another recommendation, is the further need to promote the services and the reach of PACE so that support is available to everyone who needs it, no matter the size of the business or the circumstances of the redundancy. Presiding officer, it's clear that PACE continues to play a constructive and important role within Scotland's labour market, and we are supportive of the work undertaken by PACE and the support it provides. Our amendment to the government's motion today reflects the fact that we as policymakers need to begin planning for the significant changes to the structure of the economy and the structure of working practices going forward, because if unplanned for, these could result in significant redundancies in the economy. These challenges we, we face were highlighted in a report issued just last week by the Institute for Public Policy Research, which predicted that almost half of jobs in Scotland, that's uh, over 1.2 million jobs, will be at risk from automation and new technologies over the next 15 years. This IPPR report makes a number of observations and recommendations, including workers will need more career transition support and retraining during their working life. Workers are much more likely to have multiple jobs, requiring not just one-off support following redundancy, but a lifelong platform for career transition, because these workers by 2030 will have different jobs. They are more likely to have multiple jobs at the same time, with multiple employers and have multiple careers. The IPPR report concludes by saying that without reform, we could see changes to the economy driven by automation and, and technology that will damage employment prospects for a number of sectors and leave whole communities behind. Yes. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Thank uh, the member for taking the intervention. I wonder in this regard as well if the member would like to make any comment on the article by Dave Watson of Unison in today's Scotsman, where Dave Watson says unnecessary recording and reporting at work increases costs and places undue stress in staff. Coupled with the new monitoring systems, workers are being turned into robots before they are actually replaced by them. Trying to work that out with pace, but I, and on, on you go. I've not read that article, to be fair, but uh, look, I think we've all uh, got to recognise that best practice in the workplace is uh, good management, as well as best practice is the only way the Scottish economy will remain competitive, given the increasing competition we face across the world. Um, and so to deal with the challenges I mentioned, um, these, are, these are large challenges, and I certainly don't expect PACE in its current form or capacity to have all the answers or deliver all the solutions to the uh, challenges raised in the IPPR report. However, as a multi-agency partnership, including the enterprise agencies, Skills Development Scotland, trade unions and various industry bodies, we do hope that PACE will be able to play an active role in helping to formulate policies and strategies to anticipate these significant changes in the economy and workforce. 
While these changes driven by automation and new technologies no doubt represent a significant challenge, they also present significant opportunities. If we can get the policy response right, we can capitalise on these new technologies such as fintech for the benefit of the economy and the creation of new jobs. That's why our amendment today calls for the Scottish Government to follow the advice of leading organisations in Scotland and to actively participate in the UK industrial strategy. As part of the industrial strategy, the UK Government has announced it will invest £4.7 billion to be used across the UK in science, research, development and innovation in areas such as artificial intelligence, smart technology, robotics and 5G wireless. Significant investment in these key sectors will help the economy to capitalise on the opportunities available and hopefully avoid the worst case scenario of the wide scale redundancies that may, if we don't get the policy response right, may be the downside. As the Scottish Chamber of Commerce said yesterday, uh, given the struggling performance of the economy in Scotland, we need a coherent industrial strategy for the UK, and this must be fully supported by both the UK and Scottish governments. Deputy President Officer, to conclude, we are very supportive of the range of work undertaken by PACE and the support it provides in redundancy and related situations. However, we must look forward and start to plan for the significant changes that will impact the structure of the economy and the nature of work in the future. To do so, we urge the Scottish Government to proactively engage with the UK Government's forward-looking and ambitious industrial strategy and take advantage of the trading opportunities we have with the rest of the United Kingdom, which represents over two-thirds of our trade. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I apologise to Ms Smith. Of course, you're quite right. I see in the amendment from the Conservatives automation. So you're absolutely pertinent with your intervention. I now call Richard Leonard to speak and move amendment 5630.2. Mr Leonard, a Liberal with a small L, seven minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, what we're debating here this afternoon um, is a consequence of what happens uh, when there is market failure or a shift uh, in the market. It's what happens sometimes when there is a falling rate of profit. What happens when there is a corporate demand to boost share values or to inflate dividend payments? What happens sometimes when there is a strike, a strike of capital? and a company decides to disinvest to move work offshore? What happens when redundancies are proposed? Throughout my working life, I have seen that what happens is all too often typically this. Uh, workers, women and men, aged 50 or over, with 20 or 30 years of working experience being tossed aside. Job security, job stability gone. Occupational pensions, no more. Too many remain unemployed uh, but uncounted. Or in part-time work when they want a full-time job. Some may be moved on to a zero hours contract. Precarious employment which affects the youngest and the oldest workers the most. In advance of today's debate, uh, like the Minister, I made some inquiries about what had happened at the Quick Fit Insurance Call Centre in Uddingston, where 521 working men and women who have all lost their jobs in the last few weeks have been desperately seeking alternative work. And so I asked just yesterday uh, North Lanarkshire Council's Economic Development Department uh, to tell me what had happened uh, to those uh, working people. Um, they pointed to the cooperative work involving the council, but also the Scottish Government, Skills Development Scotland, uh, the PACE team, and Scottish Enterprise. And they reported to me that out of the 521 uh, people who have now lost their jobs, uh, 44 were either on long-term sick or actually on maternity leave, and I'm not quite sure uh, what support workers on maternity leave, for example, get in a redundancy situation, and I hope that's something uh, that we can uh, ensure is uh, properly covered. Um, they could tell me that 46 uh, were retiring or taking time out, and I 
defer again to Stuart Stevenson's point that uh, there needs to be on hand either through the trade union or perhaps uh, uh, channel through the PACE team access to people for independent financial advice on access to their pensions or to other forms of uh, uh, um, financial benefit they may have derived through their, uh, through their employment. 268, uh, it was reported to me yesterday, had found alternative jobs and often in similar lines of work uh, to the, um, to the QuickFit uh, call centre. So jobs at HSBC, uh, One Call Direct, uh, Sky, uh, and BT Local Solutions uh, were amongst the destinations where people had found, uh, had found work. Uh, but I have to say that there was no information available in relation to those people who found jobs, no information about their rates of pay or their other terms and conditions of employment, no information either about the types of employment contract they are now on. And that is again something I think which we need to consider. Uh, because I'll say in a moment or two about the, the, the audit work that's carried out by IFF Research, for example, which looks at the outcomes of the PACE process, but I think we need to be a bit more uh, proactive in monitoring uh, people's destinations uh, once they leave uh, employment and understanding better uh, the kind of employment people uh, are going into. But that is why, indeed, I found that the latest Perth Client Experience Survey, as it's rather grandly called, carried out by IFF Research and published in 2016 is so important because it does give us some insight into people's journeys after they have been through uh, uh, the PACE uh, programme and the support that PACE uh, offer. Now, the research uh, report uh, pr provides us with this profile. First of all, they established that whilst 40% uh, of PACE clients are below the age of 45, a third are age 45 to 55, and a quarter are over the age uh, of 55. Uh, two thirds, as it happens in that uh, year's uh, report, two thirds of those were men. Um, so um, I'm therefore uh, interested to hear that the Scottish Government has identified those older workers especially uh, as a group who may need additional uh, support through the service uh, that's uh, provided. But I was struck uh, in the report not just about the profile of the people who have gone through PACE, uh, but the experience of those people having lost their jobs. And some of that, uh, in contrast to uh, Dean Lockhart's assessment, some of that did cause me some concern, and I think it provides something which I think this Parliament responsibly uh, needs to consider. Uh, because, first of all, uh, the post-redundancy experience of, of people was this. 18% went into part-time work, uh, many of whom had previously been in full-time employment. A third moved from permanent contracts to short-term contracts, or worse, were in a casual job. And again, this was particularly a feature of those older workers who found it hard to move from one permanent job to another permanent job and were much more likely to be caught up uh, in uh, more precarious uh, forms of employment. Um, so those older workers, the, fi the findings of the survey and the research were those older workers were more than twice as likely to be in casual, en casual employment than those working people who have be been made redundant who are under the age uh, of 45. And there was something else which struck me um, about the report too, uh, because it goes on to make a comparison between the survey they conducted in 2016 and the comparable survey they conducted uh, in, in 2014. And um, uh, this afternoon is a time for consensus and uh, broad agreement, uh, but I think it's important that we understand uh, what those results show, because um, the conclusions are these, and Dean Lockhart touched on this in his contribution earlier on. In 2016, PACE clients were more, more likely to have taken jobs with lower skill requirements than their previous job, uh, than in 2014. So now as many as 34% uh, went into employment, forms of employment with a lower skill requirement, uh, compared to 29% uh, in 2014. Of course. 
Minister. I, I'm grateful to the member taking intervention. I think just to help the debate, I think uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the points that Mr Leonard is making. Uh, we understand that in, in 2016 survey, we're picking up a lot of people leaving the oil and gas industry, some of whom are very experienced and highly skilled. And I think it is true to say there's a phenomenon where people are having to take perhaps lower uh, occupations that require lower qualifications, maybe more temporary in nature. But there is some encouraging sign that those who are in that position do progress on to uh, better employment prospects in due course. And I hope that's uh, some encouragement to those involved. Richard Leonard. Thank you. Yeah, um, my reading of the, um, of the last part of the report, which addressed itself expressly to oil and gas workers, actually suggested that those workers with their skills are more likely to slot into forms of employment that give them uh, a, a, a kind of comparable uh, application of their skill sets. But I do take the point, uh, and it's been well made in this chamber before, that the uh, uh, levels of remuneration offshore, for example, may not be matched by equivalent uh, employment onshore for reasons I I'm sure everybody, uh, everybody uh, uh, understands. Um, but the, the, um, the report does uh, say as well, uh, talks as well about the lower levels of responsibility um, uh, that people uh, moved into employment in. So, uh, for example, in 2016, 40% uh, of those who went through the, uh, the PACE uh, programme, 40% uh, moved into jobs with lower levels of responsibility uh, compared to 32% uh, in 2014. And uh, just to, um, uh, in a sense, address the point that the minister makes, uh, if I can quote the report, uh, it, did say, it does say in paragraph 1.25, uh, the proportion of clients who had secured work with a lower level of pay than the job from which they had been made redundant has increased since 2014 from 52% to 58%. I'm conscious of the time, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, so um, uh, let me just say one or two things, if I may, about, about uh, PACE um, uh, as an organisation. Um, because um, uh, in, in preparation for this afternoon's debate, I checked on the PACE website um, uh, earlier on today, and um, the minister uh, made the point about the use of social media and uh, what we can do to use these new forms of technology, well, new to me anyway, new forms of technology to try to help improve the quality of the service uh, which is on offer. Um, and uh, when I looked on the, uh, the website, I noticed that there was such a thing as a PACE toolkit promoting PACE services uh, and support, and it covers the use of uh, social media and gives advice to both employees and employers. And uh, I, if I could make a, a serious note, uh, or strike a serious note, under the heading um, example tweets, and here I must make full disclosure that I, myself, I'm not on Twitter. I neither tweet uh, nor retweet, and never have done. Um, but the tweet example that's on the PACE uh, website currently says this. Is, uh, is your business downsizing? Check out the PACE partnership at Redundancy Scotland and see how they can help you. Well, of course, we should not be in the business of helping businesses uh, to downsize, we should be in the business of defending people's jobs uh, and uh, retaining industry. But in fairness and uh, by way of balance, when I went on to look at the advice uh, under the heading Facebook, uh, which I do uh, subscribe to, uh, the, um, uh, the question was posed in this way, which I think was a much more constructive way of putting it. And the uh, question uh, posed was, is your business facing redundancy? PACE advisors can provide free and impartial advice on the best ways of dealing with redundancy pro from providing options to retain staff or managing debt. Visit Redundancy Scotland. Uh, I'm sorry, you can all sit down because you'll have to close. You've done well. I mean, you're into, well, I well, think, I've got so 12 much more minutes. to say as well. So, uh, so, uh, so my final point then... Uh, and it will uh, be brief. My final brief point is... Um, let's ban the awful language of downsizing and let's have more emphasis on staff retention. And with that, I would like to move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. Now, we've still got some time in hand and I'm going to uh, let you know so that ev or every in the open debate can have seven minutes. But don't be naughty, don't go on and on and on. It's seven minutes. Uh, can I also remind members, if you've intervened, you've got to press your request... 
Mr. Stevenson, you're not paying attention. This is for you. If you've uh, intervened, you have to press your request to speak button again because it may not be on. You have good man. I now call Ivan McKee to be followed by Bill Bowman. Mr. McKee, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, and just before I start, I'll just uh, make a comment on uh, Mr. Leonard's speech. I think you may find, I'm uh, not being a Twitter user, you may not understand this, but you may find that the brevity and hence the uh, lack of full explanation on the tweet is a consequence of the 140 character limit, which obviously doesn't apply on the more comprehensive text you can put on a Facebook post. Of course. Do you really want to intervene in that? Yes. So, well, well, yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, it seems to me uh, downsizing is, a, is an especially long word, word with lots of characters in it. So all the more reason to change the vocabulary. Good intervention, Mr. Leonard. Thank you. I take back my comment. Yes, yeah, um, on you go, please, to the debate. Sure. Um, so thank you, President Officer, and I would like firstly to remind the Parliament of my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Uh, President Officer, technological change is a feature of our modern economy. It drives progress and it drives growth, but it also causes disconnects in business models and employment patterns. Jobs and businesses that were the foundation of employment in past decades no longer exist, and today's young people will spend their careers in jobs we can't even begin to imagine. Change is something we need to be able to manage and, where possible, leverage to our advantage. Further in higher education that trains in career flexibility, both in skills and in attitudes, is a key component of enabling our economy and our citizens to survive and thrive in this ever-changing environment. It's also critically important that government plays its role in supporting employees who are affected by this process of change at the time when that support is most needed. The process of redundancy is both painful and stressful for the individuals concerned and their families. It's a process I myself have been through twice so far in my career, and who knows what the future may hold. Of course, in many circumstances, government is able to step in and turn a job-threatening situation into survival or even an opportunity for growth. This, of course, is a first priority. The Scottish Government has been proactive in this regard, and several recent examples can be cited, including saving shipbuilding at Ferguson's on the Clyde, saving the Lanarkshire steel mills, and the recent deal to save and develop the Loch Aber smelter, a deal that offers huge potential for growth of the site and the employment opportunities it offers. This proactive government intervention is critical. In situations where rescue and recovery is not possible, then government also has a role to play, a duty, in fact, to support the individuals concerned with practical support to smooth their transition to new employment. And it is this regard the Scottish Government's Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, or PACE, is well placed to deliver, having demonstrated the value it adds to the lives of individuals going through this difficult process. PACE advisors help people to recognise their skills explore their options and prepare for their next move. This could also often be highlighting to individuals skills and abilities they already possess, which can be leveraged in the job market. It can take the form of introductions to employers looking to recruit or to other individuals in a similar situation who are looking to partner in new business ventures. It can open doors that an ex-employee may never have thought of. Change is challenging, but it can often off offer opportunities and new pathways. The form of support PACE provides includes one-to-one -one counselling, comprehensive information packs, access to high-quality training, seminars on skills such as CV writing and starting up a business, and access to IT facilities, all designed to provide tailored support and advice to those going through the process of redundancies. PACE does this through its national service and through its local teams. Raising awareness of the value that PACE can bring is important, both to employers facing difficult decisions and to employees who find themselves going through the redundancy process. And hopefully one of the outcomes of the debate today is to make the work of PACE more widely known and increase participation in its services. And we mustn't forget that while the practicalities of finding new work is key, the provision of support around the emotional impact of redundancy provided by PACE is of huge value to many employees who find themselves in this situation. The uncertainty of the, about the future that many experience in this situation often itself is a barrier to the positive attitude required to move on and find future opportunities. Best practice calls for constant review of processes and outcomes, 
driving continuous improvement to develop and enhance services. And the Scottish Government is focused on ensuring PACE continues to improve the service it provides. Regular client experience surveys are carried out and the findings used to further develop the service. The most recent survey found that 71% of PACE clients had secured work, an increase from the 51% recorded in the 2010 survey. And of those who had secured work, almost two-thirds were now in roles which required the same or higher levels of skills or responsibility. The partnership aspect of PACE is important, bringing together, as it does, the Scottish Government, local government and industry partners, drawing on the different inputs each can make to the service. And it's important to recognise also that in a UK context, PACE is unique. No other part of the UK has a comparable programme to that offered by the Scottish Government. While many factors affect the labour market, a proactive focus on helping individuals back to work or to start up in business on their own with the potential to employ others can have a marked effect on overall statistics. And in this regard, Scotland's employment performance is worth highlighting. Unemployment in Scotland has fallen by 14,000 over the past quarter and by a total of 48,000 over the year. Scotland's unemployment rate is now at 4.4%, down 1.7%, and lower than the UK level of 4.7%. Scotland's employment levels are also up, increasing 0.9% over the year, with 41,000 people, more people now in employment. Particularly pleasing, of course, is Scotland's performance in youth unemployment, the fourth lowest in the EU, and with a youth unemployment rate up 3.9% over the year. In conclusion, presiding officer, the work of PACE is part of a broader approach and strategy by the Scottish Government intervening where appropriate to save or reinvigorate key sectors and businesses, creating the environment for business creation and growth, and proactively assisting individuals who find themselves at risk of redundancy. An approach that is delivering results as Scotland's employment statistics make clear, but something we must and should continue to develop to further expand its reach and effectiveness. Thank you very much. On the button, Mr McKee, I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Graham Day. Mr Bowman, please. Um, thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, I've been schooled by you not to overspeak, so I may struggle to, um, to do so. Can I mention also that... I can uh, be gentle. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, can I mention in my register of interest that I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, who have been mentioned by the quite complimentary terms by the, the Minister today. So I, I'd also like to say that I found the Minister's um, presentation at the beginning very informative and um, filled in quite a few of the areas that uh, you don't get from just reading what's, on, what's online. So I think just over two years ago, the Chamber found itself in broad agreement about the valuable work of the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment Initiative. Back then, members paid tribute to the constructive efforts of PACE in helping those who had been made redundant to transition into new jobs or training. And now, two years on from that debate, I would wish to reaffirm the positive impact of, of PACE. I represent a part of the country where there has been a frequent need for PACE teams. Communities across the northeast are still struggling from the downturn in the oil and gas sector. The industry has moved from a, a longer-term boom to contraction, some would say severe contraction. To survive at all, businesses have needed to restructure right across the supply chain and some of that meaning downsizing in um, Richard Leonard's terminology. In this tough climate, redundancies have been unavoidable. According to the annual economic report from Oil and Gas UK, there are now around 120,000 fewer jobs than in 2014. For those that were made redundant during this period, PACE has been a valuable source of support. In particular, PACE and its 22 partners have played a crucial role in organising five North East employment support events in Aberdeen. These events have, been, have proved to be an ideal opportunity for employers to recruit from the highly skilled talent pool of former oil and gas workers. On top of that, as been referred to, there has been encouraging results from the 2016 Client Experience Survey. The good news being that 77% of former oil and gas workers have secured work most of the oil and gas workers found new roles in different industries, with nearly half saying that PACE influenced their receptiveness to alternative employment opportunities in the North East. At a national level, PACE is providing a service that is 
generally well regarded by its clients. Most importantly, the rate of employment for all PACE service users continues to be high. Between 2014 and 2016, 71% of those who use PACE services secured new jobs either before or after their redundancy. PACE has maintained consistently high levels of satisfaction with around 75% of clients expressing satisfaction with the relevance, usefulness and timeliness of its services. Without a doubt, PACE continues to play a constructive role within Scotland's labour market. Credit should be given where, it, where there is success, but I should also sound a note of caution. Celebrating the success of PACE is all very well and good, but as Andrew Grove, founder of Intel, warned, success breeds complacency, complacency breeds failure, and only the paranoid survive. Despite the... Um, <laughs> the general um, success of the PACE initiative, improvements can always be made. And I think we've heard one or two here today. Um, from the... the uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson. Um, no, I, it, it's just the member has uh, triggered a memory. Only the paranoid survive, which is, of course, the autobiography of Andy Groves who was the chief executive of the Intel Corporation, who literally came in on a Monday morning and found that the memory business that he had on Friday had emigrated to Korea. And his lessons were absolutely an object lesson in how really good value leadership can avoid catastrophe for a company. And I hope that other members will read, as obviously we both have, uh, the book uh, by Andy Groves, which is one of the seminal works on how to handle change in business. Mr. Bowman. Uh, well, thank you for that. Of course, he survived, I think, the Holocaust, did he not, and then escaped from Hungary in 1956 at the uprising time. So he's had quite a, an interesting, um, if you put it that way, life. Um, going back to um, where I was, speaking about the, um, the um, improvements that could perhaps come. One was spoken about the awareness of, the awareness of and the availability of the telephone and online support um, could perhaps be improved. Earlier intervention by PACE, if, that's, if that is possible in the, in the legal circumstances sometimes. And as been mentioned, um, focusing perhaps on redundancy support for older workers. And I think you've given some indication that you will maybe, maybe look at that. Um, those aged over 55 tended to have poorer rates of employment when compared to the younger age groups. In 2016, the findings show that post-redundancy outcomes for the over 55 saw no real overall improvement. So some form of targeted support for older workers and perhaps the ones Elaine Smith was mentioning as well would be, would be welcome. And now, I, I don't wish to rain on the minister's parade, but uh, <laughs> there is room for improvement, and, but the work of PACE would not, would, is not made any easier, perhaps, by the current government's handling of the economy. Um, as, as things stand, Scotland's economy is halfway towards a recession. There's, I don't think there's any sectors in the Scottish economy presently experiencing growth. And the Scottish Chamber of Commerce has warned that the Scottish Government's high tax agenda risks driving investment away at a time when it is perhaps needed most. There are some alarm bells ringing and we have to hope that the Government is, is listening. Perhaps not making things better with their insistence on holding a second independence referendum which as we know creates economic uncertainty which the markets do not like. Scotland's economic problems threaten the good efforts of PACE. Post-redundancy outcomes will not remain high if positive job creation falters. Now, I know the, um, the unemployment statistics are, have improved slightly, but the question is whether that is from new jobs or from people leaving, leaving the market. So that, along with abandoning your high tax agenda and make business growth your number one priority, would be my closing remark, and I ask Thank members you. to support the resolution.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Graham Day to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Day, please. Thank you, providing, uh, presiding officer. Let me begin by welcoming the opportunity to debate the work of PACE in this chamber. I, I do think that in amongst holding the government to account, MSP should also find time in this forum to highlight the excellent work carried out by government agencies. Just as we might criticise the performance of some of these, so we should be willing to offer praise where it's due. And generally speaking, we are hearing such from across the chamber. But I also welcome today because the chance is there to uh, bring to the attention of the Minister a couple of issues I've encountered in relation to PACE, both involving barriers placed in the way of their assisting constituents of mine. I'll come to these later. Members will be aware of the wide-ranging and partial advice and support that PACE offers to individuals facing redundancy. My part of the country, eight employers and 226 individuals across Angus were su supported by PACE advisors between April 2016 and March 2017. Several of the firms had gone into administration while some faced the challenge of redeploying staff. Perhaps most significantly, six of the eight Angus-based employers that were supported by PACE last year operated in the oil and gas industry. Although the highest numbers of oil and gas redundancies are, are of course, concentrated within Aberdeen City and Shire, a number of my constituents in Angus uh, have been affected by job losses also. The uh, transition training fund set up by the Scottish Government has acted as a vital support route that complements the existing services PACE can offer to individuals who have been affected by redundancies in the oil and gas sector. As members will know the TTF offers support with training grants to help individuals to retrain, upskill or get accreditation or certification that would help those made redundant get a new job in oil and gas, the wider energy sector, engineering, manufacturing, whatever. To date, there have been 122 approved applications to the training fund in Angus. The support offered by the fund to retrain and rehone the skills of oil and gas workers has been invaluable to my area. One example of PACE's work uh, in the county was its engagement with GE Oil and Gas, which is located in my colleague Mary Evans' neighbouring constituency. In August last year, GE announced that 151 employees located in Montrose were at risk of redundancy as a result of the decline in activity in the oil and gas sector. All of the employ employees concerned were provided with a PACE facing redundancy guide and offered the support the opportunity to attend support events. Over 60 of the staff attended the PACE presentations uh, where the individuals concerned were given the opportunity to have a one-to-one -one discussion about their situation with a PACE advisor. All of the redundant employees were eligible to apply for the transition fund and relocate their skills to another sector, and many did so. But of course, the success of PACE is dependent on cooperation from the firms whose employees are facing redundancy. In my experience, they encounter a very mixed landscape a few months ago, myself and my MP colleague Mike we were asked to a meeting with a local firm we'd engaged with previously. They had bad news to give. Some jobs were going. Others would be relocated as the firm shut down its local operation. I raised the assistance that PACE could provide those staff who would not be moving with the business. The response could not have been more positive. But the PACE team locally have come across other difficulties in being able to reach out to other folk in need of their help. Last year, I got wind of redundancies with a well-known firm in the constituency. My attempts to engage with the company, not for the first time, came to naught. Pace called them up, seeking access to the affected workers. They couldn't get past the switchboard. They were told to email a leaflet, and essentially it might or might not be shared with the staff. And I'm aware of another situation Pace encountered in Angus when a firm went into administration with no pros uh, prospect of being sold on as a going concern. They approached the administrator seeking contact details for the staff who'd lost their jobs to be told that these could not be passed on. I can't remember whether the reason given was data protection or the fact the staff were no, no longer employed by the firm and this meant the info couldn't be shared. Either way, it wasn't going to be provided and we had to use media outlets to reach out to those impacted. I'm particularly exercised by that last scenario. It strikes me that when people lose their jobs, nothing should be getting in the way of their accessing any and all help that might be available. President officer, I think it's important to recognise the PACE initiative was set up to not only help individuals, but provide support to firms and employers too. This can be overlooked sometimes. PACE advisors can offer alternatives to redundancy and provide solutions for employers to retain some or all of the staff. In the many cases where that's not an option, PACE offers employers impartial advice on how best to approach redundancies and to sit down with employees to discuss the situation. 
When situations like this do arise, the priceless expertise and support that PACE advisors bring to the table has to be recognised by employers, though. When firms are reluctant to cooperate with the PACE team, it can only have a detrimental impact on their employees and the families that they support. With some, that might be down to a steadfast refusal to engage with external agencies, but others may be oblivious to the facts that PACE can support organisations like themselves to secure the best outcome for all parties. This is an issue, awareness raising, that perhaps needs to be addressed. And as has been touched upon earlier, as MSPs, there's a role for us there, making sure businesses across the areas we represent uh, understand the backup which is available to them and their employees. And sadly, that is going to be increasingly important in light of Brexit. I know that the Tory amendment doesn't actually mention the B word. I'm assuming it's covered by the use of the phrase other challenges, but Brexit is beginning to impact. I was in discussions the other day with the MD of a firm in my constituency, which is going to have to make people redundant and is seeking to diversify in order to minimise the numbers concerned after losing two contracts completely out of the blue. One of those contracts came from a major company which is taking steps to downsize its own workforce because of Brexit. Alongside this, the subcontracted work it placed in Scotland is now going to the Far East. This quite clearly is a knock -on effect, has a, a knock-on effect. Brexit's starting to bite and it hasn't even happened yet. In closing, presiding officer, let me take this opportunity to thank the Skills Development Scotland team and our growth, who've done some terrific work for my constituents in Angus South and the wider Angus. Urge firms who may face the unfortunate situation of redundancies in the future to engage with the PACE advisors for the benefit of your employees and your organisation as a whole. An appeal to any of my constituents in Angus South affected by oil and, oil and gas redundancy who have not yet come forward to contact their local skills development branch to check their eligibility for the Transitional Training Fund. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Paul Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. As the Minister and other speakers have acknowledged, workers in the northeast of Scotland have had more experience of large-scale redundancies in the last two years than for quite some time. Most obvious is the downturn in the oil and gas sector, but that has had wider impacts, for example, in the closure of restaurants and pubs, uh, and uh, there has also been significant pressure on the supply chain, and quite separately, pressure on employment in other sectors, such as fish and food processing, which have cost hundreds of jobs. So PACE has been and remains important to the regional economy of the North East as to other parts of Scotland. And uh, through involvement in the Fraserburgh Task Force, I have seen both the strengths and the limitations of cross-agency working and the impact of major redundancies in a town where alternative employment is not readily available. I would particularly commend the involvement of ASDA, the union which represents the workforce at Young Seafood, and the efforts of North East Scotland College to enable people to upskill in order to access other jobs. A great deal of effort has gone into seeking to mitigate uh, the impact of job losses and to reduce the number of redundancies there. And I think all concerned uh, should take credit from, from that. And as Stuart Stevenson mentioned, the partnership approach involving all levels of government and members of all parties is valuable in ensuring that the widest possible range of expertise uh, and experience is at the table. And I would acknowledge the role Paul Wheelhouse has played in the work of that task force in recent months. Where the closure of parts of the Young's plant in Fraserburgh brought hundreds of job losses, the impact of the oil downturn on employment in the North East has, of course, to be measured in the thousands. And the Minister has already mentioned the role of PACE in relation to the oil and gas sector and in supporting individual uh, workers. And alongside the usual PACE initiative sits the Energy Jobs Task Force, again bringing together a range of partners uh, to take a more strategic approach. And the work that has been done uh, by that task force in a number of areas is to be welcomed. The Minister highlighted support for workers who have been made redundant through the Transition Training Fund and other initiatives. That is very important for those individuals, but it is also important to put those numbers in context. Where 120,000 jobs across the United Kingdom, some 46,000 in Scotland, have been lost as a result of the downturn, not, of course, only in the oil and gas sector, but also uh, including indirect and induced employment. It is clear uh, that the help that has been made available uh, has been important for those individuals, but touches only a part of the wider problem. There is a lot of work still to be done to protect the, and secure the future of thousands more jobs uh, in the industry 
in the supply chain and beyond. Offshore unions remain rightly very concerned about the bigger picture. Pat Rafferty of Unite said in November, we are in the middle of a crisis and unless there is action soon, we could be approaching a point of no return. That would be devastating for the Scottish economy, particularly in the North East. And Jake Malloy of RMT said in February, our big worry is getting through this next year. 2017 doesn't look any better than the previous two. If that's the case, then this could be the tipping point for the North Sea. And it's not only trade unions uh, which are concerned. The 25th Oil and Gas Survey from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce uh, found that businesses believe that measures taken uh, to address the crisis in the North Sea had not yet made a sufficient impact. Some of that, of course, is about macroeconomic policy. So important is the oil and gas sector to the wider economy. But it is also about how government can intervene early and proactively to avoid redundancies happening in the first place. Part of that, I think, is about appropriate training, ensuring that jobs are protected in the sector, because without properly supported training schemes, the sector could well end up losing many of its most experienced workers. Having lost one job, older workers simply may not be qualified uh, to take another uh, and need to be able to access training to allow them to do that. Apprentices, as well as older workers, were hard hit uh, by the downturn in the last two years. Many firms ended apprenticeship training uh, schemes early, leaving young people without security with regards to their future career. And that is partly why there has been so much concern in the oil and gas industry about the Scottish Government's plans for the apprenticeship levy. I know that employers will have told ministers how vital it is for them that they know in advance how this money is to be distributed to help them plan their own apprenticeship uh, and training schemes. And when the Government announced in December that uh, some of this money would indeed go back into modern apprenticeships, but some would go on other workplace training programmes and initiatives. Clearly that, that uh, caused concern for some employers in the oil and gas industry because the money they had previously had to hand uh, for training had gone into the levy and then uh, they have now learned that not all of that will come back. So clearly some issues there. While some oil workers want to move to another industry, many do not. There needs therefore to be full support for companies in the sector willing to retrain and reskill workers and for those who are willing and able to continue to provide high quality apprenticeships for young people entering the industry. The transition training fund, as the Minister has said, is important too. I have previously raised concern about transitions from offshore oil and gas to offshore renewable energy uh, and the shortfall in mutually recognised safety and training qualifications between those two sectors. I've discussed this issue recently with John MacDonald of Apito and Matt Smith of Renewable UK. I'm pleased to say that both sectors recognise the need to address this issue going forward. And it is an issue I've also raised with Lena Wilson uh, of the Energy Jobs Task Force, because it is in areas such as this that there is clearly still work uh, to be done uh, going forward. And just as uh, Paul Wheelhouse rightly agreed to extend the work of the Fraserburgh Task Force because you recognised there was still work to be done there. I would want to reiterate the same point in relation uh, to energy jobs and the oil and gas sector. I know the Energy Jobs Task Force is moving from a monthly meeting schedule to a quarterly meeting schedule. I know me members of that task force are keen uh, to contribute more and to do more to protect jobs going forward. So I hope the Minister can assure us today that there is no intention uh, to end the work of that task force prematurely. There is, it is not job done in the North East oil and gas sector. Jobs are still being lost. Contracts are still uh, being put on hold. That means uh, there is still work for PACE and for government agencies working together uh, to address uh, those matters. And I hope that we could continue to work together on a cross-party basis in broad terms uh, in order to ensure that that happens. I call Alex Cole-Hamilton to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the Scottish Government's motion today and commend the work of those 21 organisations who make up the ministerial PACE partnership they have, along with the uh, localised teams between them and through the work of the, that partnership, been able to offer support, advice and help to thousands of people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves out of work. Since the crash of 2008, redundancy has touched nearly every person in this chamber. It's perhaps affected members personally. We've heard how it's certainly affected constituents. It's happened to a family member or to a close friend, but its impact is almost always the same. 
a period of anxiety and grief, not just in the person who has lost their job, but their family and their dependents as well. A huge knock to self-confidence and a sense of humiliation and worthlessness that comes with that. I know something personally of that indescribable anxiety. I will never forget the night I was phoned by a colleague and the, and the terrible words that she said to me. I shouldn't be telling you this, she said, but I wanted you to have time to prepare that your name is on that list. The days that followed saw me desperately trying to work out what I was going to do. We'd just taken on a three-year mortgage. My wife was pregnant with our third child. My mobile phone was up for renewal, and I wasn't even clear if I would be able to afford a new contract for the next two years. Now, this is the point at which I have to check my privilege. I've never known poverty. I've got generous friends and a family to lean on for support. I've got equity in my house. But at the end of that phone call, I knew a new kind of terror that I'd never experienced before. As it happened, we managed to bring in a funding grant the following week, which staved off that next round of redundancies. But I'll never forget that sense of desperation and sheer panic. It certainly helped give me a certain empathy when a couple of years later, I had to make a member of staff redundant. It wasn't just that feeling of uncertainty as to how we get by financially. My job was my life, or at least part of it. And it was part of who I was as a person. I was proud of what I did. It gave me structure to my world. To lose it would have been... Uh, would have seemed to me utterly, desperately lost. I was incredibly lucky, but the worst that I had feared was a daily reality encountered by all too many people at every level of employment and in every sector of industry since the meltdown of 2008. Had it happened to me, then I would have almost certainly sought to engage with PACE. As we've heard, through 18 local teams across Scotland, the partnership offers a fleet of foot response to redundancy in every corner of Scotland. This response consists of a holistic package of care and support, ably stewarded by staff from Skills Development Scotland and Job Centre Plus, which addresses almost every aspect of the immediate aftermath of a redundancy and the fallout that they can, that can then have on individuals and on their families. It offers essential assistance with the basics, sorting out benefits, household budgeting, whilst building important, transferable life skills and technical advice essential to rejoining the workforce in areas things like, uh, such as CV improvement and interview preparation. But its reach and focus covers vital elements of the dreadful impact of redundancy on mental health too, helping service users to cope with the stress and anxiety whilst building resilience in particular. It is this pastoral care, this pastoral role, which I believe, believe gives PACE uh, a, hu a hugely welcome humanitarian edge as well. Vital Deputy Presiding Officer, when you consider that 40,000 suicides are linked to unemployment and job insecurity worldwide each year. Now, I want to recognise, too, the work of PACE with Scottish Government and partner organisations in their efforts to adapt to the landscape of redundancy in this country. Whilst the partnership had been previously targeted at large-scale redundancies, uh, a regular feature of the start of this decade, by reprofiling through the introduction of a national helpline, improved website, the partnership teams are far more readily available to individuals and small employers, particularly in rural areas at times of redundancy. Reconfiguring in this way has helped the partnership to adapt to the change in economic outlook, which has seen a decline in large-scale redundancies and has such seen assistance offered to some 4,500 individuals and more than 800 businesses. When considered in the context of the families and support networks around these individuals, that reaches greater still. I welcome this adaptive approach and if I could offer one recommendation to the Scottish Government and by extension to the partnership, on how it might adapt still further, it would be this. Please, please try to do more for older people facing redundancy. Those workers made redundant over the age of 50 find it harder than any other age group in our society to re-enter the workforce. And many find themselves locked out of the labour market for the rest of their lives. It's essential that PACE teams engage with these workers at the earliest opportunity and offer enhanced support over and above their normal assistance package with training for IT literacy and indeed job brokerage. But to a point, some of that responsibility to older workers lies with us here in this chamber as well. We need to rise to the very real challenge of age-related workplace discrimination in our society and do so with the same vigour with which we greet the discrimination of any other equalities group. 
Presiding officer, this is a motion around which every member in this chamber should coalesce. Now, I'm very grateful for the, uh, the camaraderie and the sense of unity around this issue this afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to thank the staff and organisations involved in the work of the partnership and to thank the Scottish Government very much indeed for raising this in Parliament today. I call Angus Macdonald to be followed by, if you excuse me a moment, the member's not in the chamber, to be followed by, and neither is that member, I'm terribly sorry Mr Macdonald, followed by Gillian Martin. Okay, uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate on pace. Um, ironically, what, the one time I'd managed to trim my speech down to six minutes in advance. Um, if there's one thing which unites us as members of the Scottish Parliament, it's, a, it's the drive to help and represent our constituents who find themselves in all manner of situations for one reason or another. And I'm sure uh, we all speak regularly, regularly to constituents who are at risk of losing their jobs or have indeed lost their jobs through decisions made to close sites, businesses hitting hard times, or decisions by companies to move operations elsewhere, leaving a hole in the local economy, leaving uh, workers, sometimes in significant numbers, looking for alternative employment. Uh, as you'd expect, it's certainly been the case that residents in my own constituency of Falkirk East have been hit by the threat of job losses. Most recently, over 200 people in Falkirk District have been faced with this prospect due to the announcement by Frank who operate the Cairn Phoenix plant making granite sinks and bathroom equipment to consolidate and move their manufacturing operation to Slovakia. Uh, Cairn had been operating for, or has been operating for over 258 years in our area uh, and is one of Scotland's oldest manufacturing companies embedded in Scotland's industrial heritage. So to say its closure was a sore one uh, is certainly an understatement. In these situations, it's frustrating that more cannot be done to save the jobs directly, and considering the skills levels and the, the length of service some of these workers have, it can be a daunting and difficult position to be in to know where to begin, especially if you're having to start out in the jobs market. So clearly that's when pace kicks in. Partnership action by the Scottish Government, SDS, Scottish Enterprise, and the local authorities working together to prepare workers for the challenges and path placed before them has proved to be invaluable in Falkirk District and beyond. Over 2016-17, the Falkirk Pace Partnership has assisted with several redundancy situations, including uh, Cairn Phoenix, which I mentioned earlier, also street sweeper manufacturers, green machines, and BHS, amongst others. Uh, and Pace has been instrumental in providing guidance to employees and agencies involved with the companies in question. 389 people over that period have benefited from the support and advice available from PACE with extremely positive feedback. Most employers are impressed by the support available to them as a business, and this has enabled them to provide support to their staff at what can only be an incredibly difficult time. Clearly, the earlier the intervention, the better in terms of planning the support required. However, this is obviously dependent upon every individual circumstance. With regard to the Cairn Phoenix situation, a plan was initiated to provide employability workshops, futures fairs, support with literacy and numeracy, as well as self-employment workshops, which were delivered by Business Gateway Falkirk, as well as the identification of short vocational opportunities and the offer of accreditation of uh, prior work-based learning. Similarly, some of my constituents who were faced with, early closure, with the early closure of Longanet Power Station benefited from PACE assistance with an on-site resource centre being established to deliver redundancy support services to all staff, including the considerable level of contractors on site. Advice on benefits, employability support, business startup advice, and support to access training all contributed to 370 people being supported. 52% of those people are employed full-time, with a level of 18% being economically inactive. However, in terms of progress, presiding officer, there is light at the end of the tunnel. With support from the Scottish Government, particularly from uh, Minister Paul Wheelhouse, who recently met with the Falkirk Economic Partnership to discuss the progress in the Grangemouth Investment Zone, there is a positive vis vision within my constituency. And can I take this opportunity to thank the Minister for the help and encouragement he and his officials have provided locally in recent months. These measures, when realised, will mean that the Falkirk TIF initiative will be expanded, which will enable a wider programme of assistance covering infrastructure provision, 
energy and enterprise growth. And I've no doubt that this will lead to further opportunities for people in Falkirk East and across Falkirk District as a whole who are seeking employment now or in the future. Of course, in an ideal world, the support PACE provides would never have to be called upon. However, the economic uncertainty due to a number of varying factors, uh, Brexit was mentioned earlier, uh, at times where redundancy is inevitable, PACE can be the difference between continued employment or an uncertain future where the market and advice is available, but not necessarily the easiest to access. What PACE delivers locally and nationally is of vital importance in, this difficult, uh, in these difficult situations, and I'm pleased with the work being done in my area to help and support my constituents as and when it's required. But it's not all doom and gloom, President Officer. The unemployment situation has been stabilising with numbers dropping, uh, and it's fair to say Falkirk District has a positive outlook and an exciting future. During 2016, Business Gateway in Falkirk assisted 283 start-up businesses in the Council's area, and tourism is a big new growth area for Falkirk District, generating over £100 million annually and now employing over 2,000 people locally. In addition, the Council's economic strategy for Falkirk document details plans to create an investment zone of national significance at Grangemouth, and of course Ineos is clearing about 250 acres of land which will create about 200 acres for co-location sites expected to attract up to 500 jobs, maybe more. President Officer, Business Gateway in Falkirk is forecasting that new business and the expansion of existing enterprises could bring around 550 new jobs in the next three years. So the future looks good for my constituency. And with the vision and energy the proposed new minority SNP administration will bring to Falkirk Council, the need for any future PACE intervention will hopefully be greatly reduced. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sadly, there are few, if any, people in my constituency that don't know someone affected by redundancy from the oil and gas sector. For decades, it was a reliable and stable area of the economy, not just for those directly employed by oil and gas companies, but also for the tens of thousands of people working in the supply chain connected to oil and gas and those businesses benefiting from the disposable income of high wage earners in the sector, which have led much of the hospitality and retail sector to flourish. In the last two years, a decrease in the global oil price and the reluctance of the UK government to offer loan guarantees to exploration companies has meant significant job losses in the sector. And there's now a pressing need to provide support to the men and women making a real effort to upskill, retrain and find new ways to work in a very different employment landscape in my area. PACE has been instrumental in, in providing such support. Last year alone, they helped over 1,000 individuals in dealing with redundancy. In December, they reported having more than 2,000 apprentices, apprentices in training. And that came alongside fantastic news that, uh, um, that out of over 11,000 16 to 19 year olds in Aberdeenshire, 93.2 were in learning, training or work. The tangible difference been made in the lives of people who worked in oil and gas and the new options been highlighted for constituents like mine is a development that I welcome. In March of this year, PACE held an employment event in Aberdeenshire, bringing together 800 individuals affected by oil and gas redundancy, with over 50 exhibitors to speak to about job vacancies and other opportunities to use the skills that these people have already learned. Physically bringing together employers with their prospective employees is such a simple, but it's a very effective way of giving people a chance to get back to work, and I commend PACE for taking these steps to identify opportunities like this. PACE brings together many employment support agencies and programmes that are available to the people of the North East. More than 400 new training places are now available for people leaving the oil and gas sector to gain the skills they need to move into other industries, thanks to the Transition Training Fund. This 12 million fund was set up by the Scottish Government to offer support with training grants and to help people retrain, upskill and get accreditation or certification that would help them to get a different job in oil and gas the wider energy sector or engineering and manufacture. And let's not forget that people in oil and gas are some of the highly, most highly trained people working in Scotland today and have had to go through years of uh, rigorous training on, a, uh, on an almost kind of like quarterly basis. And a lot of the certificates that they have um, have to be uh, looked at 
in terms of how they can be transferred into other disciplines. Areas such as renewables, construction, teaching, road haulage, smart meter insula in installation and rail are sure to benefit from the highly educated and skilled people trained in oil and gas. The Transit and Training Fund and Energy Jobs Task Force ensure that these routes back to employment are created and communicated. And there's a myth that former oil and gas workers aren't interested in readjusting to new types of work. Um, but the reality is that when you, you speak to people worried about their job or their future, that they, they absolutely want to contribute to the Scottish economy. They want to provide for themselves and their families. And they do genuinely want the opportunity to work in a, a stable sector. I mean, look, let's not forget, a lot of these people went through a, a situation in the early 90s where they, they had to maybe take a pay cut or, the, or a rate cut, or they lost their jobs then, maybe going back into the industry. They don't really want to go through that again. Um, so they're very keen to be redeployed in other areas of the workforce. Um, it makes perfect sense that we as a parliament support the redeployment of skilled people into different areas of the workforce. And I want to thank all the members who came to speak to SDS representatives from the Transition Training Fund. Um, I hosted them at the end of last year in parliament. Um, and I know a lot of the members got a lot out of that, those conversations. Um, I also want to mention some work that I've been doing when highlighting is issues of discrimination from certain employers against former oil and gas workers that I've found when I've been speaking to some of my constituents. I've been working with a local journalist, Fiona Stalker of BBC Scotland, to draw attention to this. And as a result of the publicity, many more oil and gas workers have been in touch with me to share their stories. And I hope I've been able to help some of them. Um, but also, uh, more positively, as a result of the report in Reporting Scotland about our work in this area, the Road Haulage Association got in touch with me. And they invited me to come along to an open day that they were holding for oil and gas workers who'd been made redundant. And what they're doing is they're using transition training fund money and putting people through their HGV license training. And they're working with employers in the road haulage industry to fill the many vacancies that they have in, in haulage. Um, since my afternoon with these trainees who've ranged in age from early 20s to, to over 60, I've been able to put a few of my constituents in touch with the RHA to access the training, the latest being just yesterday. Some uh, employers that I've spoken to um, in other sectors in, in my area have been very wary of employing former oil and gas workers. And they've said this to me, that they're worried they'll invest in them only for them to up sticks and move back into oil and gas when the industry recovers. But the people I spoke to at the RHA recruitment day all said they wanted to retrain and permanently move into a new sector. Many of them wanted a life on land for a kickoff, with more time with their families, working in areas with less susceptibility to market forces out with their control. And from the RHA point of view, they wanted to recruit highly skilled people, and they recognised that oil and gas workers are highly skilled in terms of health and safety, problem solving, maintenance, and are used to working in very challenging conditions. Um, there are sectors where there are skill shortages and I would urge those sectors to work with SDS and PACE to follow the example of the Road Haulage Association. But I'd also like to point out there's a whole generation in my area that's only ever worked in oil and gas. Um, and uh, many of them have actually even worked for like, the same company. Uh, I've got an, a, an example and a friend of mine, Neil Bailey, who worked for um, Halliburton for 25 years and was made redundant on his 49th birthday. Um, Neil has moved into the social care sector um, very successfully and, uh, and, and I would like to encourage people to think more broadly, not just about sort of engineering opportunities, but maybe taking the opportunity maybe to, to go into sectors where we really do need people and where you could have a very uh, successful career. Um, I'd also like to encourage more people to take advantage of the new routes into teaching that the Transition Training Fund offers. It's hard to believe it when you hear some members of the opposition speaking about Scottish schools, but it really is a great career. One of many of my families work, work in this uh, area. And we need STEM teachers with valuable industry experience to help get our young people ready for the challenges of the century as it unfolds. In the Education Committee, we've heard testimony as to how invigorating people moving in from, uh, to teaching from industry are in the classroom. It's incredibly important that the availability of this workforce is harnessed by other sectors who can recognise the contributions that the people of the Come to close, please. have made to the success of oil and gas industry. I believe that my constituency will emerge from this downturn as a more diverse, adaptable region, and I welcome the efforts being made through projects such as PACE to help this become a reality.
I call Jamie Green to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Partnership Action for Continuing Employment remains ever vital in our rapidly changing economy. Uh, so I make my comments today in the spirit of the ambitions of PACE. As oil and gas revenues continue to decline and economic conditions do remain tough, it is important that we have a clear focus on getting people back into work. Figures out yesterday show that UK unemployment rates now stand at a 46 year low. And I welcome those figures. In the UK, 4.6% of people are unemployed. Well, let's compare that, for example, to Spain, where 18% of adults are out of work. Or in Italy, where 12% are out of work. Or even in France, where it's 10%. So one could argue that we are faring reasonably well compared to our European neighbours. But 4.6% still equates to 1.5 million people, and 120,000 of those people are in Scotland. So there is always, always a duty on us to improve the employability of our workforce. So I support the work of PACE. But we also want to see the Scottish Government implementing some of the recommendations in the most recent PACE survey. In particular, more could be done to reach out and educate people on what options are available to them when they learn of redundancy. Uh, redundancies and indeed long-term unemployment can be very challenging experiences, financially but also emotionally. It's not just the economy that suffers when people aren't working, uh, people suffer as well. Being out of work has a negative, negative impact uh, on your mental health, on your feelings of social inclusion, self-value and self-pride. And I think this is exaggerated when someone finds themselves out of work uh, after redundancy, perhaps from a job they've held for many, many years. And as we live longer and indeed healthier lives, there is a wealth of experience in our over 50s workforce and one which I think is often overlooked. Now, admittedly, PACE has seen some uh, successes, such as high job outcomes for those using the service, and it is going from strength to strength. It's great to see. Uh, three quarters of individuals using PACE said they were satisfied with the service they received, and I welcome this. But at the Scottish Government's most recent PACE conference held in March this year, a number of very important points were made by the audience panel members. For example, increasing uh, the acquisition of basic skills more early on to deliver job flexibility later in life. I'd also like to look at some other points. Uh, one suggestion that I was struck with was that of making local economies less reliant on big, large employers, uh, a more di diversified economy, if you like. But the million dollar question is, how do we do that? Uh, what preemptive measures or precautions can be introduced early on? How do we attract? newer, smaller indigenous businesses to our towns. Now, the notion of having one big local employer is one that we hear often, but that comes with a huge risk as well. Uh, another area I would like to look at is the suggestion of improving access to the PACE system. Uh, in my view, enhancing PACE's digital activity will be vital in engaging with people. Uh, moving towards an enhanced and more immediate online service is important. Uh, for those who uh, perhaps aren't on social media or don't have access to the internet uh, as, as widely as, as, as others, uh, we need to um, uh, offer alternatives. For example, a phone call. Uh, in my view, a phone call might simply be enough to help alleviate that initial stress and fear when somebody uh, learns of redundancy and wants someone to talk to about their options. Um, nothing replaces face-to-face -face help, of course, but I would like to see a marketing campaign that tells people where they can turn to as a first port of call. I think many will immediately think of their local job centre uh, and immediately their thoughts may be starting to turn to, uh, to what benefits might be available to them. But also I think there should be a mindset change in that there is opportunity there. They could go straight into another job if they're suited to be qualified and if a job is available to them. Of course, I want to see pace work, but pace alone won't be enough. Uh, we should point out the Scottish economy contracted in 2016's final quarter. If it contracts again, then we will be in recession. And in that environment, pace becomes ever more important. But skills training is not sufficient without job creation. In my view, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Gillian Martin mentioned STEM subjects because I think they create opportunities for career changes. Uh, they can open doors in an ever-changing workplace. But it is important to point that 1,000 STEM, STEM teachers have disappeared from the profession in the last 10 years. 
I don't say that to make any political points, but purely to demonstrate that I think if our workforce were equipped with sufficient STEM skills, then they could transition more easily from industry to industry. For example, if you did work in the oil sector as an engineer, could you make a career in renewables? Uh, one example I saw was uh, in our rural economy committee was we, met a, uh, we went to a forestry company uh, that was actually uh, desperately needing new recruits to, to work the machinery that they had invested in, quite heavily invested in. And they were actually recruiting from uh, warehouses where people were able to drive pickup trucks. And the skills they, they had in using pickup trucks were able to be transferred and they were able to, to be taught how to, uh, to use the mach complex machines that fell, strip and chop up trees. In my local area in Greenock, uh, I've seen uh, the, the, the town transition from buzz, bustling business parks, which used to house companies like National Semiconductors and IBM. And today, those big industrial parks lie barren and grass-covered. They are indeed skeletons of an electronic heyday. And the mood changes in a town when a big local employer closes. But these derelict sites should be places of opportunity. Um, I worked for a time uh, in the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where the old Philips factories, uh, which closed down, are now bustling havens for young entrepreneurs and tech startups. And the mood of that city has really changed. It is positive and upbeat. It has to be seen to be believed. I should also declare that I sit on the industry task force uh, in Inverclyde for one such business, uh, Texas Instruments, which is seeking to close or sell its assets. And I've seen firsthand how uh, sitting around the table with uh, the people uh, that can help the workers really makes a difference. These are consensual discussions. Uh, the local employer is invited to participate. And I think that's why it's really important that the comment that Stuart Stevenson m made on the importance of having the businesses themselves around the table is absolutely vital. Uh, I'll close by making uh, one final point in what has been a fairly uh, consensual discussion. Uh, PACE needs a top-down focus. Uh, I see the Finance Secretary is not here today, but I do hope he is listening. Uh, his focus should be on growing the Scottish economy 100% of the time, because businesses will always open and close. That will not change. But a flexible workforce that can transition from company to company, or indeed industry to industry, in my view, is the key to mitigating the devastation that business closures can bring. Preparation is everything. Thank you. I call Lillian Smith to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. I have a relevant declared interest as an unremunerated director of McQuick Limited Bagpipe Covers and also as a member of Unite the Union. Um, in researching for this debate, I came across a comment from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and I'd like to start by sharing that with colleagues, if I may. They say, all people have the right to economic initiative and to productive work, to just wages and benefits, to decent working conditions, as well as to organise and join unions or other associations. President officer, work should provide people with security, a decent salary and stability, but for too many people, their jobs are insecure, they're low paid, and they're often threatened or undervalued. And in work poverty in 21st century Scotland is unacceptable, as I'm sure most colleagues would agree. Scottish Labour is committed to full employment and, um, as an economic and social goal, and that means working to ensure that everyone who loses their jobs are helped back into work. And in terms of today's debate, the focus, of course, is on PACE, which works well to support individuals when the closure of a factory or business means that a number of workers are facing redundancy. As might be expected, as colleagues have said, this has been a relatively consensual debate. And I, along with my Labour colleagues, do support the efforts of PACE and the hard work done, but with the proviso that we should always strive to try and improve these services and to retain jobs. The PACE survey found many of those that had used the service felt it would be beneficial if PACE got to them earlier, and that's a point that has been mentioned by other members. However, it is, of course, also fundamentally important that trade unions and government are given time to explore all the options to try and prevent redundancies. And as Labour's amendment says, the development of effective, proactive approaches to support existing jobs in industry to seek first and foremost to avoid redundancies is vital. The survey also found that most of the people using PACE had success finding new employment at a similar level to their previous employment. But the slight downside of that was that people finding these jobs were often having to take a pay cut to get them, and we have heard that from other members. Of course, PACE is a corrective measure, it's not a preventative one. And it's basically, I suppose, 
a tool for damage limitation and perhaps could be more proactive. I think the Minister did mention in his opening that that was something that was being explored. Um, and I think to address this, maybe we could focus beyond continuing employment. Given that Pay Across Scotland showed the weakest growth in the UK in 2016, but of course that did still equate to real terms increase, uh, to be fair, I would put that in, we do have to consider the long-term effects of redundancy. When half of the pay survey uh, showed that people were now earning significantly less than they were in their previous roles. So if jobs are leaving Scotland and are not being replaced with jobs at similar rates of pay, then that's a net loss for the Scottish economy and it will have a major effect on workers and their families. So whilst attention must be paid to addressing redundancy, we also really do need to consider um, how we can retain jobs, particularly in parts of the country that might be losing out to the big cities. So in central Scotland, the area I represent, we have recently lost companies like QuickFit, Airdrie Savings Bank and Tannoy. But we've also lost many local government jobs um, and HMRC jobs are also under threat. Personally, I ran a successful jobs fair with the help of um, SDS. And if members uh, are keen to do that, then I would certainly recommend it as being helpful to people in local areas. In central Scotland, there are many people with innovative ideas and inventions trying to start small businesses. PACE can try to assist those who fall victim to redundancy to start their own business with the help of Business Gateway, but these services have historically been available to those who are part of large-scale redundancies. We should do more to try and assist all people who are made redundant and interested in, in trying to start up a business. And I was pleased to hear that moves are being made in that direction. And I note the interesting comments made earlier in the debate by Stuart Stevenson. Bad practice presiding officer by employers, particularly towards women who need time off for family and caring reasons, can cause stress, insecurity and can end up in redundancy situations. And that, of course, um, does have a relevance to PACE. And these stories can be lost in the face of the headlines about large-scale losses, but they exist and we need to listen to them also and take action. I want to briefly turn to the issue of people with disabilities, which I uh, intervened on the Minister earlier about. Um, and that I think um, people with disabilities do have very specific concerns when they're trying to find jobs after redundancy. And particularly for people with learning disabilities like dyslexia, the prospect of having to fill in a CV, face an interview, search online for a job can be very worrying, can cause a loss of confidence, and that can make securing jobs harder. Now, I did check with PACE advisors in central Scotland, and they said that there's not much they can do at present other than signpost to other organisations and point to benefits that might help. So I think there should be clearer recognition of this issue so that we can tackle it appropriately and perhaps more direct expertise within PACE would help. Although I do have to say, President Officer, I was very pleased um, in the Minister's response to my intervention that he's noted this point and he is going to be taking that forward. Um, obviously, PACE as a model for continuing employment, as the Minister indeed said in his opening remarks, doesn't meet the needs of everyone. And that is something we must address if we are to continue to improve the service. If we can identify the individual concerns and needs of each worker earlier, then we can begin to improve our response to redundancy. And whilst PACE is a good Scottish initiative, um, and I very much welcome the Continuous Improvement Programme to ensure that Scotland can be an example for the rest of the UK on how you value and utilise people's skills to benefit both them and wider society. Presiding officer, I would like to finish, um, actually, a way in, in sort of the way that I started, but this time with remarks that were made by Pope Francis in 2015. He said, it makes me sad when I see people without work who do not find work and haven't the dignity of bringing bread home. And it cheers me when I see that political leaders make great efforts to find jobs and to seek to make sure that everyone has a job. Work is sacred. Work gives dignity to a family. We must pray that work be not lacking in any family. Thank you. Oliver Mundell, followed by Stuart Stevens. No more than seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate on the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment. In 2015, this chamber praised the positive efforts of PACE in responding to redundancy situations. And I know that since then, as we've heard in the debate, many improvements have been made to that service. I, for one, am particularly pleased to see 80 skills and development staff uh, now work alongside job centre staff to enhance the work of PACE. 
a national helpline revamped website and improved information services have also increased the visibility and accessibility of PACE services for employers and individuals. These enhancements have enabled a strategic uh, focus, or change, sorry, in the strategic focus of PACE, which was initially set up to target large-scale redundancies, but with more dedicated staff uh, and uh, accessible services, PACE can now open up its uh, doors to more individuals and employers, particularly in rural areas like my own Dumfrieshire constituency, where in the past, small-scale job losses have not been seen as important as larger scale uh, job losses uh, with big companies closing in the central belt. Uh, these improvements have been very much uh, welcomed, uh, particularly uh, last autumn when Penman Engineering entered into administration. It had been in operation locally since 1859 uh, and was one of the area's biggest employers. It was threatened uh, with closure uh, and losing this historic firm uh, looked like it was going to be a major uh, hammer blow to the local economy. Uh, wave, of, wave after wave of redundancies came and the workforce shrunk from 140 employees to a skeleton crew of just 50. This was devastating news for our local economy and a deeply distressing time uh, for the families who relied upon jobs at the site. From the outset, PACE offered a quick and efficient response. Uh, relevant assistance and guidance was immediately offered to all of those who were affected by redundancy. Um, and I particularly thank uh, the Minister as well uh, when I have the opportunity for the advice uh, and support he gave me as a member uh, during what was the first uh, major round of job losses uh, in my own constituency. Um, but PACE uh, really did uh, make a difference. And it's not a service which operates in isolation. It's a partnership of 22 organisations that coordinate a response uh, to redundancy situations uh, such as that we saw at Penman's Engineering. And as one of those partner organisations, Scottish Enterprise, who worked very closely with the administrators, were vital in turning round the fortunes of Penman Engineering. Uh, and the speed of the turnaround was quite remarkable. In September last year, the firm entered administration. In October, the firm started to search for a suitable new buyer. And by November, new owners were secured. And since then, uh, contracts have grown and the workforce has already risen to 67 employees. And every step of the way, every effort has been made to re-employ the old workforce. And that is really important in a rural area like Dumfrieshire, where there aren't all that many similar opportunities uh, for those with the particular engineering skill sets of the workforce. And it was undoubtedly true that the efforts of PACE and its partner organisations were very constructive uh, in Dumfries at that time, just as they are across Scotland. Although that said, expectations do need to be managed. Despite the general success uh, of the PACE initiative, it is still possible for PACE uh, to find further improvements to its redundancy support services. As we've heard from other members, the findings in the 2016 PACE Client Experience Survey point towards a number of recommendations. A quarter of clients who used the PACE services felt that the introductory presentation and information guide came too late in the process. This needs to be improved as clients need to know how to access redundancy support as soon as possible. Further to that, awareness of the online PACE services and telephone helpline remains relatively low. If PACE is to satisfy the growing need among many uh, for follow-up help, uh, then much improvement is needed in the promotion of these services, and I hope that today's debate goes a little bit of the way towards doing that. Beyond improvements to the PACE client experience, the Scottish Government must also do more to drive investment and in growth and business support. And I must stress again, that the good efforts of PACE are made all the more possible by the work of its 22 partners. And I very much hope to see a 23rd partner very soon with the creation of a new South of Scotland vehicle, which will hopefully complement their work and tailor their services to support the specific and recognise local needs and economic challenges. I also hope that a new vehicle will be able to work alongside uh, the proposed Borderlands growth deal announced in today's Conservative Manifesto of the UK general election to help create a stronger, more resilient and dynamic local economy. 
In doing so, I hope we can reduce the risk of further redundancies and deliver a broader mix of high-skilled, well-paid employment, particularly in traditional textile towns like Langham, where industrial activity has been in decline in recent years. Presiding officer, in closing, I wish to join uh, Dean Lockhart by calling on the Scottish Government to follow the advice of leading organisations to cooperate with the UK Government's industrial strategy. Cooperation is needed from all levels of government if we are to see businesses plan ahead for the future trends in our economy. And as the Scottish Chamber of Commerce stated yesterday, Scottish businesses are competing on a global basis and need the coordinated support of all levels of government to give them the edge and to enable businesses to create high quality employment opportunities for all. Whilst PACE has been generally successful, the Scottish Government must do more to support the Scottish economy by cooperating with the UK industrial strategy, offering their full support to the Borderlands growth deal and by delivering on the long overdue promise of a South of Scotland Skills and Enterprise Agency. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Bill Bowman introduced uh, Andy Groves to the debate, and uh, I, I thought there was another quote that might be useful in this debate. The ability to recognise that the winds have shifted and to take appropriate action before you wreck your boat is crucial uh, to the future of your enterprise. Um, or in Dutch, ein ship op het strand is ein beacon waar am zee. A shipwreck on the shore is a warning to the sailor, uh, is, uh, is, is a saying that's uh, well recognised. Um, Andy Gross, of course, talks in his uh, autobiography about strategic inflection points, when something suddenly happens that you haven't seen coming and how you respond to that. And in history, it's happened many times when Fra Fritz uh, Haber discovered the importance of nitrogen fixing. It led to the end of the run rig system of agriculture to enclosure and the, the removal of many people from the land. That is, of course, benefit, you could argue, uh, of why there was a workforce to uh, create the Industrial Revolution. Not sure it helped the people very much. Uh, their lives were much more miserable in the city squalor that they experienced than it probably had been in the rural area. By the same token, McCormack's uh, Reaper, invented in the 1830s, transformed uh, the way uh, in which employment worked in agriculture and, of course, uh, Cartridge's power loom of 1780s. Uh, absolutely through uh, many people out of work. The division of labor uh, has uh, de-skilled many people over the years. It's not new, uh, Plato's Republic uh, referred to the division of labor. So it's an idea that's been around uh, a, a long time. Uh, Adam Smith talked about it in his Wealth of Nations in relation to the manufacture of pins, uh, so we know. Now, that's the mechanical world and the threats that have been, computers bring their own new threats. First of all, computers from the 1960s onwards automated routine activities that were often done by vast numbers of people in back offices, uh, then moved to creating new products that displaced existing products from markets. And with the advent of the internet, they threaten and will threaten even more in future our high streets as retail changes. And the next big revolution is here with us now, and that is artificial intelligence, which will displace many intellectual activities. So therefore, I will, yes. Elaine Smith. Thank the member for taking an intervention. And uh, if I might just share something else that Dave Watson in his article today said, which was, like all new technology, the robots probably won't deliver all that they promise. In the meantime, human beings in the workplace deserve a bit more dignity and will deliver more without being turned into robots. I wonder if the member would agree with me that the dignity of labour and the dignity in the workplace are extremely important. Stuart um, Stevenson. The member is absolutely correct. I haven't read Dave Watson's article. I will make sure that I do before the uh, sun uh, goes down behind the yardarm or whatever it does uh, later in, in the day. I think the important thing, however, is I want to just uh, give a few further reflections on what happened in Fraserburgh, because that's the experience I've had uh, of, of pace. And there are one or two things that are sort of not process things that it's worth looking at. Getting all the people in the room that we had 
And the government very generously provided tea, coffee, and biscuits. There was a lot of genuine informal networking in breaks in the meeting, before the meeting, after the meeting, that I suspect had as much value as the formal session round the square of the table in the leisure centre in Fraserburgh. And it also meant that some people who had responsibilities couldn't escape the people who were affected by how they discharged those responsibilities. And I think that was quite important. The other thing that I saw in the Fraserburgh experience, we never, as far as I'm aware, discussed it, but it appeared to work on a Chatham House basis. In other words, we were able to open up and talk about things in some comfort that what was said in that room would not be taken up and used to disadvantage the people who were present outside that room. Although, of course, as under Chatham House rules, we could refer to the matters that were discussed in that room. Now, I don't know if other uh, interventions and major uh, events like the uh, hundreds of people who were going to lose their jobs in Frisbee is typical of how it worked. But I thought that the, these, these soft things about how it actually worked in practice, driven by the personal characteristics of many people in the room. The trade unions were there. I think at the first meeting we had four three or four trade unionists present, and Unite did an excellent job in representing their workers. But even they had a difficulty because in the factory concerned, we had a huge international workforce, multilingual, and there was support on translation services that helped the unions make better contact with many of the people who weren't actually union members for all sorts of historical reasons, but nonetheless properly required the kind of support that came uh, from the trade unions. So creating that opportunity for people in the room to be supported, to support the workers, uh, was a very uh, good aspect. Having the company in the room, because the company essentially was being run from Hull, with management decisions really being made in Hull, and a competition between the opportunities in Hull and in Fraserburgh, each offering different things. But having the company in the room made a huge difference to their understanding of the future and the future support that they could be given to the future development of their uh, facility in Fraserburgh and I think that ultimately protected uh, that, that, that facility uh, for the longer term and uh, Oliver Mandel might be interested to know that because of where, where it was we had both Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise in the room and that was immensely valuable because they each brought different things specific to their areas just as I'm sure uh, the South of Scotland Enterprise uh, company uh, will do so. It was exactly, of course, one of these strategic inflections that got us to the task force. It was the quite sudden and unexpected loss of the most profitable contract, because the, the, the purchaser took that business and put it elsewhere, that created the need uh, for the pace response uh, for uh, that. So I think uh, I will simply end by saying, uh, if anybody's learned anything, Richard Leonard has earned the curse of the 140 characters on Twitter Let's hope uh, Donald Trump lands it sometime soon as well. Presiding officer. And we move to the closing speeches. I call Richard Leonard. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, listening to today, today's debate reminds me that um, I went to meet Skills Development Scotland in Airdrie uh, on the 6th of March, uh, and they could tell me that the oil and gas workers uh, training transition fund had helped 43 workers in Lanarkshire. Uh, and uh, again, last time I checked, uh, just uh, earlier on today, 58 uh, working people had been helped in Lanarkshire uh, through the, uh, the training uh, uh, transition fund. So uh, this is an issue that we need to tackle right across, uh, right across Scotland. But of course, the eye of the storm um, is in the northeast, and Gillian Martin and Lewis MacDonald uh, uh, and others mentioned uh, the importance of supporting uh, workers who have been in the oil and gas industry uh, seek alternative employment. But I'm also reminded that the Energy Jobs Task Force uh, produced a 10-point plan which included a, a, a requirement or an encouragement at least upon employers in the oil and gas industry to look at non-labour costs, to look at sabbaticals, to look at ways of maybe reducing hours rather than laying people off at job sharing uh, and job loans. And uh, the truth of, of the matter is, as I see it, that these are very large, in many cases, uh, multinational corporations uh, amongst the biggest and wealthiest 
uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and down the years, they've made uh, rather considerable profits. Uh, and um, if and when there's an upturn, I suspect they'll be the first people to complain that there's a shortage of suitably skilled labour available. And so perhaps we should return to putting a bit more pressure uh, on, those, on those companies. I, I'm also bound to say that um, uh, the Wood Group has been mentioned uh, uh, over the last 12 months in debates that we've had in here about that downturn in the oil and gas industry. And uh, according to my reading, around 3,000 jobs have been shed uh, by the Wood Group over the last year or so, uh, but that didn't stop uh, Ian Wood and the Wood family uh, rising in the Sunday Times rich list this year to uh, a, an elevated position of wealth of an extra £160 million pounds, uh, compared to the previous year, uh, and the Sunday Times calculate the accumulated wealth is worth about £1.6 billion. Uh, but let me turn to the Scottish Government uh, and the Scottish Government's uh, labour market strategy, which was published last year, uh, and uh, mentioned on page 17 in a chapter uh, called Ensuring Our Labour Market is Resilient uh, in the Face of Economic Shocks. And uh, it said usually the pace response is sufficient, uh, complemented by business support offered through enterprise agencies or local authorities. Uh, and I'm not sure we wholly agree uh, with that uh, uh, analysis. And maybe this goes to the heart of something we haven't really debated this afternoon, but I think we should all... Uh, understand uh, is an underlying issue here and that's this time after time uh, members of this parliament have come to this chamber with reports of threatened job losses uh, in their constituencies uh, and in their regions and often this takes place uh, and I direct re my remarks including to, to Dean Lockhart often this, this takes place at the start of the formal consultation period with the trade unions um, and uh, there are sometimes good reasons why trade unions do not want pace involved at an early stage because the whole point of the redundancy consultation is to seek ways of avoiding redundancy or reducing them before you get to mitigating, uh, to, before you get to, to mitigating them. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Um, so um, uh, there's a view that uh, certainly we hold um, on the Labour side that um, sometimes uh, sending in the pace team as a response in those situations is frankly insufficient uh, and uh, we need to look at ways of uh, trying to prosecute campaigns uh, to fight harder to retain uh, existing jobs and I'm bound to say as well uh, that uh, the decision of the Conservative UK government uh, to cut back in the case of large-scale redundancies the time period for that redundancy consultation from 90 days to 30 days has frankly been uh, unhelpful uh, it's a regressive move uh, and it's a move which I think uh, should be uh, reversed. A couple of things I'd ask the Scottish Government to consider. Uh, one is whether it should provide more resources or any resources for trade unions to develop alternative plans uh, in a situation where closure uh, is threatened. Uh, uh, whether, as is a current uh, Labour Party proposal, whether workers should have a statutory right uh, in the case of a closure or a transfer of ownership, a statutory right to buy the plant or workplace uh, uh, they live in, uh, and also whether they should be putting in place uh, an industrial strategy rather than simply relying on uh, a defensive uh, reactionary approach uh, when there are uh, crises uh, 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 developing. Um, but to the Conservatives, uh, whilst we will um, uh, support their amendment uh, tonight as well as the government motion, uh, I do say uh, that does not uh, mean that we subscribe to the, to the Greg Clark view of industrial strategy, who in his foreword talks about pro-competition rules, flexible labour markets, less intrusive regulation and continued austerity. That is not a strategy we would support. Uh, rather, we would turn to one uh, mentioned by Elaine Smith, which is one uh, built on full employment, uh, patient uh, capital investment and a planned approach to uh, economic uh, development. And very finally, He's I'm in the last finishing. few seconds, um, as the government's own motion spells out, this is important work uh, which the PACE team does, which is why uh, I, I say gently, and I'm not trying to point score here, but I do gently say, which is why cutting the grant in aid budget to Skills Development Scotland by £5 million this year uh, will not help. And I hope that the Minister uh, and the Finance Secretary and the Cabinet Secretary you who's back close, with us uh, will uh, re revisit that decision uh, in the weeks and months to come.
I call Gordon Lindhurst. No more than eight minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, today's debate has largely been a consensual one as we have discussed pace and um, certainly I think there is agreement across the Chamber about the importance of pace uh, that it has for those who face difficult times as a result of redundancy and also the achievements of pace in getting people back into paid employment. I was myself disappointed recently to hear news of potential job losses of up to 260 at the Jabal manufacturing plant in Livingston, and this is but one example of a recent announcement that may require urgent action to be taken, uh, although it remains in that case to be seen how many people will actually be affected following consultations and natural turnover. It is clear that PACE may have a role to play there. And Looking to the wider picture, it is important that PACE takes on board recommendations given to it through the Client Experience Survey held in 2016. Now, a number of today's speeches made reference to the need for quicker engagement with clients, with a quarter of respondents to the survey I've just referred to feeling that the presentation and information service came too late for them. Now, I think the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, referred to the assistance being the earlier the better. And um, I think I, my ears misheard at one point when he talked about a thousand vacant roles in some contexts as being a thousand bacon roles. Um, but I was pleased when I paid closer attention that uh, that was not the point he was trying to make at that point. So I'll move on to uh, Oliver Mundell's speech, and it was encouraging to hear that he spoke very highly of the quick and efficient response given by PACE to Penman Engineering in Dumfrieshire when that situation arose. Uh, we also heard from my colleague Bill Bowman in his erudite speech of the valuable assistance for those in the oil and gas industry. And I would hope that in future cases throughout Scotland, uh, others that are affected in this unfortunate way have the same experience of PACE being of assistance to them. But there is also a need for PACE to expand its services in two ways. Um, the recommendations tell us that more needs to be done to tailor support for older workers aged 55 and over who typically have poorer post-redundancy outcomes. And uh, my colleague Alex Cole Hamilton, who is here today with his trademark brown leather shoes, and uh, which coalesce with his suave blue suit, referred to the need for more coalescence, and uh, I would echo that. I thought that Jamie Green painted a vivid picture of the emotional drain of being out of work. As he said, for younger people, a wider variety of skills can help. But for people of older years, who have perhaps been in work for decades, redundancy can be a very new and probably deflating experience. That, uh, combined with worry over lack of opportunities for work towards the end of a career, can add to very significant pressures on such individuals. Perhaps by publicizing in a better way the PACE online and telephony services, which is another of the recommendations, those in the older age bracket can have better access to PACE, thus increasing post-redundancy opportunities. Likewise, younger people immersed in the digital world should benefit from greater awareness of the online services. These appear to have a very high satisfaction rating amongst those who actually use them. Uh, unfortunately, take-up has been somewhat slow, and in the modern day when the ability to use technology is vital in the workplace, more people should be encouraged to use that service, which will in turn contribute to skills development. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is pleasing to note the successes of PACE, to which I've already referred, uh, not just the fact that jobs outcomes are uh, almost at three quarters, but the 64% of those new jobs required the same or higher levels of skills. And it's clear from that that not just any outcome will do, and I hope that PACE continues to improve on that good record in the coming years. Um, it is clear, however, that there are 
pressures that are coming to bear on the questions that PACE deals with. As has been highlighted today um, by colleagues, Scotland is falling behind the rest of the UK with the real threat of the economy slipping into recession. Growth is sluggish at best in Scotland, with the economy in Scotland contracting by 0.2% in the fourth quarter of 2016. And although, as the Minister has said, the Scottish economy grew by 0.4% in 2016, the UK economy grew by more at 1.8%. And as Dean Lockhart uh, pointed out, there are other significant challenges that face all economies, not just the Scottish economy, as patterns of working and ideas and technologies develop, progress, and change. Richard Leonard mentioned concerns about insecure contracts. That is part of the picture, and certainly in the gig economy, this needs to be approached in a new and progressive way. Workers often have jobs which are set out in a very different way than traditionally has been the case. And we are still only just learning, not just in Scotland, but in the United Kingdom and other countries, how to deal with these developments. Traditional working patterns have given way to more flexible and pragmatic ones. And it is important that we keep pace with these. Uh, Theresa May has this week announced that workers' rights and protections are to be extended to people working in the gig economy and I would welcome that. It is vital that as the structure of economies around the world changes, the UK is at the forefront of dealing with this in order to maximize our potential whilst protecting jobs. PACE alone cannot deal with all of these developments and we need a holistic approach. The UK government has been consulting on its new industrial strategy to address these long-term challenges and I would join calls to the Scottish Government to seek to participate and cooperate in that fully. It is a strategy that all parts of the UK can work together on to ensure that we are stronger together as we have been in the past. And I would close by saying that I am obliged for the support that is to be given to the Scottish Conservative Amendment. I now call Paul Wheelhouse up to five o'clock, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank members for genuinely constructive, intelligent and very thoughtful contributions that have been made across the chamber today to this debate. And as Gordon Lindhurst has just uh, acknowledged in his own uh, final remarks, I do wish to reiterate the point that uh, regarding the importance of raising awareness of PACE uh, to ensure that those individuals who find themselves in a very unfortunate position of facing redundancy are able to access the excellent support available through PACE that, that members have acknowledged. Uh, because that is key. I mean, a number of members have referenced the fact that um, uh, the uh, experience survey suggests that the earlier the people, people are looking for earlier engagement with PACE and indeed that we know that the earlier engagement does have that impact. It is really important that members try and reinforce to employers as well as to the workforce that they are aware of what PACE can do for them, so they're asking for it from their employer, but also that employers know that it can be a very discreet service which doesn't necessarily need to flag up the companies in distress. It can be done with a con on a confidential basis uh, and without any uh, bangs and whistles being fired off while people are going in. So it is, it is possible to help and, and hopefully, as members have acknowledged, try and avoid redundancies in the first place. The earlier we can get in there, the more likely that is to happen. So the, the PACE partnership it really is what it says in the TIN, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, a national framework underpinned by a diverse range of organisations working together in pursuit of a common objective. And I would just say, in reference to the point that Gordon Lindhurst raised in his, his speech uh, around Jabil, an uh, important employer uh, in, the, in the Lothians, that um, 68 staff have unfortunately left, left the business, but we are, just to reassure members who have an interest in that issue, we are engaging uh, with the company through our PACE team. And indeed, only yesterday visiting a business in Glasgow, uh, Spire Global, who are involved in the space industry, have employed people who have come from Jabil uh, in that sector. So that's encouraging, specifically looking for people who have got the kind of experience and skills that are coming out of that kind of clean room environment in a, in a, in a semiconductor factory who know how to put together uh, small cube satellites for use in, in space. So there are hope, there is hope for people that we can find jobs for them. And through providing skills development and employment support, PACE aims to minimise uh, the time people affected by redundancy are indeed out of work. And as demonstrated through 
the work of PACE, we can make a real difference to individuals facing redundancy, a real difference to their families, importantly. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton made very important points about mental health impact, and as have others, on, on people who are affected by redundancy. And uh, like Alex Cole Hamilton, I've worked in an environment where redundancy was a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, fear we all had, and I know the impact it has on you. So it, it can make a real difference to the communities and a, indeed a real difference to the Scottish economy. So we therefore need to continue to work together with our PACE partners to maximise the benefit that comes from working together uh, in partnership and to continue our efforts to enhance the operation of PACE through our continuous improvement programme. And I reassure members we are very much intending to do that, to continue to reflect and improve as we go forward. And I thank the engagement of all the PACE partners in the evaluation process and being very open and frank about the changes that need to be made. Uh, and a number of members today have specifically highlighted the point around the over 55s and, and to reassure members that is very much a focus uh, for our, uh, our, our work going forward to try and make sure we can tailor services to address the specific needs of that age group. But our evidence, uh, the, the positive note, our evidence shows PACE is effective in supporting individuals and it is critical we're able to provide that support, as I say, as early as possible. And our research findings do, as have as uh, been highlighted a number of times today in October 2016, highlighted that those who do receive pay support, 71% obtained employment, which is uh, not ideal. We'd obviously like to see 100% of people getting, getting work, but it is uh, gives hopefully something that gives people confidence if they are affected by an imminent redundancy that there is a very good chance they will get work. And although the, the outlook for the Scottish economy is promising, there does indeed lie ahead much uncertainty, as I stated in my opening remarks regarding Brexit. Well, I will. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, will the Minister acknowledge that I'm <laughs> Mr. Stevenson. So, will the Minister <laughs> acknowledge that uh, a number of people who initially contact PACE for all sorts of reasons drop out of contact, so perhaps 100% over ambitious? Paul I think that is a fair point and um, I, I know great efforts have been put into trying to trace individuals who've left employment after in the case of Young's, that was a, clearly an issue that Mr Stevenson has highlighted himself in terms of a large number of accession state workers who were working in the factory had moved on and considerable effort was, try, was made to try and track them down and make sure that help could be given uh, to them. Uh, but uh, Bill Bowman, in a very constructive speech largely, if I, if I could say, I'll focus on the bit that's more of a concern to me, uh, but was a largely constructive speech, uh, did raise some points about the economy. So I think it's important to highlight um, a number of points. I mean, there are, it's not true to say there are not growth opportunities in the Scottish economy. There are a number of sectors that are doing very well, thankfully, in terms of life sciences. Uh, uh, Dean Lockhart also mentioned fintech in terms of the financial services industry. I'm extremely optimistic that fintech will be an area of the Scottish economy where we'll see significant growth in future years and the government is working very closely with industry through the Financial Services Advisory Board and uh, working with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the team such as Louise Smith um, uh, from Royal Bank of Scotland to try and make sure we deliver uh, the necessary investment to support the growth of that sector. And we are investing in our future through £6 billion of infrastructure plan and a £500 million Scottish growth scheme which, which will hopefully be up and running this year. We're making substantial investments in transport and digital connectivity. We are committed to reducing the burden of air passenger duty, which I appreciate is not supported by all members in the chamber, but to improve, aimed at improving Scotland's connectivity. And we do plan to invest more than one billion in our universities in this uh, current financial year and supporting collaborations between universities, businesses and others through our innovation centres. Establishing a board of trade and uh, creating permanent trade representations in Berlin to add to our innovation investment hubs in London, Dublin and Brussels and using our tax powers to support growth in the economy uh, on business rates. We've also reduced the overall rates burden by around £155 million in the current financial year and ensured that more than 50% of all properties pay no rates this year and over 70% paying the same or less than last year. I know these issues will be familiar to members in the Chamber. I think it's worth reiterating though that we're not standing uh, still here, we are working through pace, but we are also trying to reflect the points being raised by members fairly that we need to be proactive and try and create the right business environment to sustain employment and prevent job losses in the first place. And that's very much our focus. We might disagree on the method, but I hope members will take reassurance that we are very much focused on the task of trying to do exactly that. Um, in terms of the economic outlook and Brexit, I've mentioned that earlier on. I want to focus mainly on the comments that have been made by uh, members in the Chamber, some extremely good contributions uh, from members across the Chamber uh, in relation to points that are raised by colleagues such as Gillian Martin on the fate of oil and gas workers. I, I very much recognise the concerns that have been raised by Gillian Martin today about those people coming out of the oil and gas industry. The irony is, of course, that those individuals have high degree of experience 
uh, have uh, reliability, they've demonstrated their capabilities over many years, and it is a shame if there is any degree of prejudice against them in the workplace. But I can assure the member that we are, we are focused on trying to help individuals through transitional training fund and other means, but also uh, some encouragement has been received from interrogating IFF who have done the work for us that in, in the uh, qualitative research we've done with those individuals who were less satisfied with the services that came through PACE, uh, identifying that actually many of them uh, who are struggling to find employment, uh, we've heard from uh, those in the FSB, uh, the Federation of Small Businesses, that actually small businesses are actually looking for those older workers who are reliable, who are um, uh, highly skilled, experienced and less likely to jump ship than perhaps uh, those groups who are there only for a temporary basis. They appreciate that older workers are, are looking for longer term employment. Um, Angus Macdonald made some very good points around the support in terms of Grangemouth. We are clearly trying to work with the local authority and local enterprise agencies and indeed uh, local business community to try and support regeneration in, in Falkirk. And he rightly highlighted the tourism potential of Falkirk, which uh, I think really has been transformed in recent years with the uh, building of the Kelpies and, and other projects which have made Falkirk a tourism destination, perhaps not for the first time, but certainly an enhanced, uh, enhanced view of the local uh, area for and, uh, the member Michael Matheson also sitting here nodding away. So I've uh, obviously won favour with uh, Michael. Um, but I think um, it's important to highlight that uh, Richard Leonard made some very fair points about the digital material. I will look at the point he raised around language. Uh, there is the curse of the 140 characters on Twitter, but that doesn't mean we can't look very carefully at the wording we do use, and I will uh, give him a guarantee to take that up. And he raised the point very fairly about maternity staff, and they are invited to attend PACE presentations and to be involved in that process. Uh, obviously, need the collaboration of the employer to give us access to those individuals, but I reassure him that uh, we are very much focused on the needs of those individuals. Uh, I'm running out of time, uh, presiding officer, uh, but um, uh, just to say that I again thank all members in the chamber for a very constructive uh, debate, uh, very good points raised. My colleagues at the back who are largely responsible for helping deliver, deliver pace will have no doubt noted down very many positive suggestions that we made today and I thank members for them and I look forward to working with them on a bipartisan basis to help all those who are affected by redundancy in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes our debate on partnership action for continuing employment. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 5630.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend Motion 5630 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on PACE, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 5630.2 in the name of Richard Leonard, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of the Minister Paul Wheelhouse, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that Motion 5630 in the name of Paul Action, uh, as amended on Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. I close this meeting.